Thank you. Um, well, tonight's uh, webinar that we've got on tonight is, is all about ICSI. Um, it's one that we've been planning to do for a long, long time. And boy, if we got a panel for you tonight, I'm so excited about the people we've gathered around the table. I really am. We've got hundreds and hundreds of people that logged on tonight. Uh, it's very much, I know I'm normally talking about stallions and, and all that side, so it's slightly out of my comfort zone, but that's why we've got an expert of panels in front of us uh, tonight. We're going live on Facebook as well, so um, hopefully we're going to have a, a, a good showing on there. Um, and, um, you know, there's an array of guests. So um, just to welcome some of the, the pe people that's going to be on tonight. Um, uh, we've got Professor Cesare Galli from Aventea. Hopefully I've said that right. I mean, Aventea really is the pinnacle. I mean, they're the ones that have really led the field uh, when it comes to ICSI. Uh, they're very much the leading clinic in Europe and the world for OP, ICSI, uh, with, with decades of experience and, and fantastic results. I remember going over there. I didn't actually go to see his pl place, but uh, I went to a um, place down the road with Michaela. So I think it's nearly 15 years ago. And we said, God, this ICSI, this is really something that should be in the, in the forefront, you know, on, uh, for animal breeding and, and going on. And, and look where it is now. It really has. And uh, obviously, uh, Avantea, you know, what they've done over there, uh, really setting the standards and the bar really, really high. Yes, there are other places around the world, but I think this is this is really the go to place that people have gone to for uh, around Europe. And it's great to be joined with uh, Professor Cesare Galli tonight uh, and to he's going to talk about his experiences. Um, these these events cost a lot of money to put on, you know, uh, and a lot of time. And really, without our, our title sponsors tonight, Cooper Surgical, we really would find it difficult to run these. So it's a big thank you for them. Cooper Surgical is a global leader in human IVF uh, and reproductive genetics, providing lab and theater equipment and RI witness, electronic witnessing systems, hopefully I've said that uh, correctly, and culture media, pipettes, oversight collection, needles, catheters, amongst many, many other products. And join tonight, we've got to, uh, Dr. Steve Troop, from, uh, re who is a reproduction consultant of Cooper Surgical. So I thank you a lot for supporting it tonight, because as I say, um, uh, without you, we wouldn't be able to um, put some of these on. Also, uh, we've got other sponsors tonight, Twombo's Hall Stud Farm. Uh, it's a family run business, and it is one of the UK's leading AI embryo transfer uh, uh, um, OPU and hopefully to be ICSI centres soon, supportive for four resident vets and has a recipient herd of over 220 mares to support their breeding programme. And Dr. Monica Morganti, she's going to be uh, joining us tonight and be giving her experiences on, on, on ICSI and OPU. Uh, we've got Sussex Sasswine um, and, uh, you know, they're providing a wide range of sport horse stud medicine services, including artificial insemination and embryo transfer. And, and Katja, God, I don't even know how to pronounce your surname. Sorry, Katja, I'm not even going to try. I don't even going to go there. But I've known Katja for, for many years and uh, they've been really working with OPU. And I, know, I think it's, it's quite a few years now that you've been perfecting and doing this technique and been sending uh, oversights to Italy. Uh, so it's going to be great to pick up on her knowledge uh, and how she carries this out uh, uh, as well. Uh, we've got equine reproduction supplies joining us, experts in managing mares for natural breeding and artificial insemination, embryo transfer, uh, and they're based in the North England. And obviously James does uh, a lot of OPU. I've known James for a, a long, long time. I feel like we've grown up together uh, for, uh, for, 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 through the reproduction ranks and, and, uh, we, and he's got his wealth of knowledge you know, not just in the OP, in, in, in really reproduction stands in alone, you know, what he knows uh, in the stallion side and the mare side uh, for many years. I must admit, I quite often pick the phone up to him as well. He's a wealth of knowledge. Uh, Equus Vets, there are other uh, sponsors tonight. Um, there are an independent equine only practice with four dedicated and experienced equine vets located in Devon and just starting into the world of OP and ICSI. And we've got Dr. Neve Lewis, who's also speaking tonight, a, a, an assistant professor of equine reproduction of University a College of Dublin. And again, we've known Neve for a long, long time, and uh, and she's obviously 
she worked with us at Twanlows many years ago to have one of the, the first foals on the ground in the UK by the ICSI method. We want your questions, they come in. So uh, we've already got one question. Will it be recorded? Yes, it is going to be recorded. So it will be going out, out, out there. Um, so um, yeah, so try and get your questions coming. We can't ask, answer all the questions as we go because we've got a lot to get through uh, tonight. And uh, these expert panel are going to be talking about their expertise. So, but we'll try and get some questions in. If not, all the questions will be asked afterwards. So don't worry about that. Um, it'd be always quite, I always quite like to know where you're listening from as well. So you can always put that in the chat and we can always give you a bit of a shout out. Last time, I think we had 51 different countries uh, um, tuning into us. We're from all over the globe. We've already heard from UAE. I know we've got Michaela. I spoke to her earlier. She's, uh, she's, uh, she's uh, seeing from, from, from uh, Germany. And Peter Deals uh, is just typed in, yeah, fly the flag for Belgium there. Um, Again, these nights that we really try and run them as a sort of a non-profit, we don't want to lose money on them. But one thing we do try and do is raise a bit of money for our charity, which is Nature Safe. So you will get a, an email after this uh, uh, just to saying, um, you know, if you did enjoy the webinar, it'd be great if you can do a donation to Nature Safe. Nature Safe is one of the first ever living tissue banks out there for wild animals, uh, saving animals from going extinct. So it's close to my heart. So uh, yeah, we're getting America, we're getting from all, all Brazil, Sweden, they're all coming through, which is great to see on, on the chat. So we're going to be talking tonight, obviously, about get, uh, with Caesar, uh, uh, and he's going to be looking around, his, he's going to be telling his experiences of ICSI, and it's going to be great. We're going to look around his lab as well, which is, which is brilliant. So uh, also, the experts are going to be talking about preparing the mare, the health testing, oocyte pickup, the procedure, shipping these oocytes, uh, the ICSI procedure, the costs involved as well, and, and really the future of ICSI and, and, and how it's going to uh, go on. Um, so please get your questions coming in. And then we're going to look around, obviously, some facilities in, in the UK that are set up uh, as well. So I think you've heard enough of me, really. I think it's uh, we've done our bit here. Uh, I think it's uh, very much over uh, to, to Caesar. I did, uh, 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 Ches Ray, sorry. I did sort of say to him before, one thing he's not allowed to mention is about the Euro Cup. I thought he might have an Italian flag flying in the background uh, after they beat us in the Euros. But uh, it's great to have you here, it really is, uh, Cesare, and uh, uh, your knowledge and what you've done and, and built up over the years is just quite outstanding. Um, and we hear all about all the oocytes being sent down to you. And I think you're going to be a little bit busier as well if, if anything to the gold medal of the Olympics is to go by with, um, with the you know with that stallion with with Shaco Blue, I, it'd be nice to know what your percentage of Shaco Blues down there. But I think he's been one of your most prominent stallions. Is is, is that right? Yeah. Yes, that's true. Yeah. I think I think it's going to double and treble now with 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 with, with uh, winning the Olympics. But but it's really over to you. And, and thank you very much for for agreeing to come on tonight. And yes, it'd be lovely to hear about your experiences. So if you can uh, share your screen of your PowerPoint, uh, uh, Cesare, and it'd be great to learn about all your experiences and where you got to today. Yeah. Do you see it? We just got your presenter screen on, so it's the other way around if possible. So you just share it again. That's it. Now, if you just, if you, if you do it on present. That's it. Perfect. Yeah. Over to you. Yeah. And, uh, good evening to everybody. And thank you to Liz for the introduction and for the invitation. So I will go through this uh, PowerPoint to just put into the picture uh, what we are doing and uh, where this came from and uh, what we where we are today. So first of all, we are placed in Cremona, which is a little town uh, south of Milano in the middle of the Po Valley. It's a landscape of uh, agricultural land and it's famous for the tower uh, in the Duomo, but it's most famous for the violins. Uh, Stradivari is born in Cremona, so 
think someone knows Cremona for the violin, but now we are also known for the ICSI activity in, uh, that we do. <coughs> uh, this activity started uh, you know, with us many years ago, and uh, then there's been, uh, we joined uh, forces with other collaborators, other clinics that now have grown to, to a handful, as you can see here in different countries. Initially with the Netherlands was the first uh, Tom Stout group in, uh, in Utrecht University was the first to start that started sending our site to us, but now we have uh, uh, quite a few others. The core activity of Avantia is uh, it's not restricted to the horse. In effect, it started with cattle. We did uh, many years working cattle assisted reproduction, and that has been uh, one of the advanced advantages that we had over other uh, group uh, working with in this field. and. Uh, so we mastered the uh, in vitro embryo production in different species, uh, embryo production and also stem cell technology, mainly livestock, cattle, uh, buffaloes, uh, horses. Uh, recently we've been involved in saving the Northern white uh, rhino uh, by producing the first embryo and uh, also first stem cells from this species. But we have also an activity in, uh, in cloning. We are also known for <clears throat> being the first that clone a horse in the world. And uh, now we are cloning pigs uh, mainly for, gene for biomedical use uh, through genome uh, editing and, and nuclear transfer. So the uh, in vitro embryo production technology can be summarized in this slide. Uh, we have three steps, uh, basically the one here where uh, you collect uh, all sites from the ovary uh, of a dead or living animals, uh, uh, mainly from live donors. The eggs are then uh, brought to the laboratory and subjected to in vitro maturation. The second step is uh, in vitro fertilization, where uh, um, by conventional means of uh, co-incubating egg and sperm for some species or uh, with a horse, uh, the only way to get reliable fertilization is through sperm injection, what is called ICSI. The third step uh, that follows is to incubate the newly fertilized egg uh, into uh, the incubator for uh, about a week, uh, eight days. So then it goes and there goes uh, segmentation and then marula formation and blastocyst. This uh, stage of the embryo sits into the uterus. Therefore, it's easy to replace it into a recipient by non-surgical means. Moreover, at this stage, uh, cryopreservation works well for in vitro produced embryos. And this is a great added value to the uh, technology. So, um, Briefly, this is uh, the outline of the presentation, uh, the history. We, uh, I started uh, many years ago when I was a, a young postdoc at Cambridge, collaborating with the Twin Cullen. Uh, so in the 18, 1989, so 32 years ago, we published the first embryo produced after in vitro maturation only. So we matured the eggs in vitro and then transplanted them to inseminated the recipient mare and flushed out the first embryos. Uh, uh, then uh, we went on, uh, you know, after 10 years, when I returned to Italy, we took on again in collaboration with a group in Bologna, Gaetano Mari and others. Uh, uh, we um, were able to replicate other steps of the technology. So we were able to achieve fertilization in vitro through ICSI and also to uh, cryopreserved uh, implant and obtain offspring uh, uh, by all, all the way through. In the meantime, we also obtained a clone horse uh, uh, in 2003, and this was helping actually to develop, to, to learn. We learned how to use the piezo for, uh, that was then used also for ICSI. Uh, more uh, later years, we published in 2007 a review where we summarized the uh, data of about five years' work, and uh, which became to become it started to be um, clinically value, uh, value, valuable and also um, reproducible. 
And uh, finally, our last publication in 2020, where we summarize a lot of data of the last three or four years. So this was the first uh, horse uh, ICSI fall born by uh, all the way through in vitro maturation, ICSI, uh, embryo culture in vitro, cryopreservation, and non-surgical transfer. Um, so this is uh, the type of uh, services that uh, Avantea offers. So we can do oven pickup, of course, at our location and then take on the eggs through X in uh, embryo production. But uh, since a few years, we are also receiving all sites from uh, clinic that uh, collects their own location, uh, all sites from the mare, they are shipped to us. We can, we produce the embryo and we freeze the embryo and then the embryos are returned to the clinic that send the oocyte and then they can implant uh, in their own uh, recipient. We can also do uh, cell banking of uh, specific or particular uh, uh, animals as sort of life insurance and eventually we can go on to clone from those cells, uh, the animals, but we will not be talking about this uh, tonight. So how practically the technique uh, happens. Uh, um, so day zero, uh, we consider uh, conventionally the day that the egg is fertilized with the sperm. So if we consider this day zero and is the day of when X is performed. So the, the story starts two days earlier. So day minus two, when uh, the oocytes are collected from the donor mare, in green, it's uh, what can be done into what is done in the clinic and in cyan, what is done in the laboratory. So as you see, the mare is put in a stand. We will see later on uh, Kachi Duchenne talking about this in more detail, but uh, you know, it's a teamwork. Uh, um, the eggs, uh, then the bottle where the, the, the fluid is, aspiration fluid is collected, is brought to the laboratory, the eggs are retrieved and they are put into maturation or they are shipped if the clinic uh, doesn't uh, um, relies on us for the production and doesn't have the uh, in vitro in reproduction laboratory. So two days later, as I say, on day zero, we fertilize the mature eggs. So only a percentage of the eggs uh, reaches a stage where it's mature, about 70%. On average, we collect about, you know, depending, we, we get about 12 eggs per session. Uh, beginners get about five, six eggs. Uh, and then uh, these eggs are, uh, after injection, they are cultured in vitro for uh, seven, eight days when uh, they reach uh, this stage, which is called the blastosis, early blastosis. So it's actually smaller than one you would flush out from a male uterus. And these stages are very suitable for freezing. And, uh, and in fact, we freeze almost all of our embryos because they are you know, transfer at the best when it's convenient. So the advantage of having a frozen embryo is that you transfer it when you thaw and transfer it when you have a recipient at the right stage and that you like with a good corpus luteum and a good uterus. If it's not suitable, you know, you can wait another cycle. If you have a fresh embryo, you are limited uh, to the selection of the recipient. Therefore, this is another reason why we get such a good results with transfer because you're able to also not only select the embryo because we have a, a few, but also you are selective on the, on the recipients you're going to use. So from the beginning to the end, it takes about uh, 10 days. Um, so we do uh, monitor our donor before collection so that we know what to expect. We aim at having at least five or six follicles larger than one centimeter, but some cases you end up aspirating what you have. Sometimes we aspirate mare with one follicle only because they don't have many more. Um, the mare is sedated. We use only domosedetomidine uh, for as a sedative, and uh, we do perform epidural anesthesia to relax the rectum and so that you can operate. Uh, we drain the blood, so then you can operate in uh, absolute comfort uh, inside the mare. 
we use a 12 gauge coaxial double lumen needle connected to an aspiration pump at one end and the other end we flush the follicle of the syringe. Um, we're not uh, really critical about size because we try to be as fast as possible. So we aspirate uh, probably follicles that are in excess of 0.5 centimeter. At the end of the procedure, we uh, give uh, the mare flunixine meglovine, one shot, and then for prophylactic preventive reasons, uh, three days antibiotic cover. This is uh, how it is done. This is actually cow back, but uh, the probe is inserted in the vagina and the ovary is grabbed through the rectum and is brought close to the follicle. This is uh, live, what you see here, it's uh, this follicle, the large one at just about one centimeter from here to here is one centimeter. You see the needle going through. What is important, it's, uh, you see that the ovary is continuously moving because I, I continue to try to work the ovary around the, the needle so that the surface of the follicle is scraped. Otherwise, the follicle, the oocytes will not come out. Uh, and the recovery rate matters how you scrape the follicle because you simply fill and empty the follicle, the oocytes will not come out, especially in the larger the follicle, the more difficult it is to recover it. And so you can see here, it's filled. we flush at least 10 times if we can, the, the follicle, each follicle is flush. Uh, so the procedure can take uh, anything from, uh, Depending on the number of follicles, it could be up to an hour if you have a mare with maybe 60 follicles. So sometimes this happens, but usually it's about half an hour, uh, the, 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 the aspiration. This is how they look. Uh, these are two, four collection of large numbers. You can have large cumulus, uh, small cumulus. Uh, basically, we put to mature all the oocytes unless they are clearly lysated so you don't see anything inside the, the zona pellucida. So at this stage, if the sacs are collected locally, they can be put to the maturation the same day. If uh, they are collected by a clinic that uh, they are going to send it to us, uh, they are put into cryovials and uh, we can send the media ready uh, for uh, the ones with the media ready for shipping. The shipping is done at 20, 24 degrees, so basically warm room temperature. And they use these boxes. Uh, they cost very little money, about 20 pounds per box. And they keep uh, 24, for 24 to 48 hours, if the weather uh, outside is not extreme, uh, at least for 24 hours, they keep constant temperature. <clears throat> Once uh, the eggs have uh, reached uh, completed maturation, they are clean as it's shown here of the surrounding cells so that we can see if they are mature. The maturation is uh, it's confirmed by the presence of a polar body. This, this little cell, you can see it here clearly here. Yeah. So those that have reached this stage, they are, in, they are suitable for injection. In the same time, another technician is preparing the semen. We work almost uh, only with frozen thought semen that is coming from uh, registered uh, AI production centers. Uh, uh, it's uh, thawed and uh, we need uh, to inject uh, even, we need a few, but we need live sperm. If the sperm are dead, uh, success is not, uh, is not good. So we need to have a few live sperm. So we centrifuge, uh, over a density gradient. And uh, so then we can select few live sperm that then uh, under the inverted microscope, they are uh, subjected to, they are injected into the oocyte. This is, uh, you need an inverted microscope uh, with a special optics. We use uh, an Hoffman modulation contrast which allows you to use plastic dishes. Some clinics uh, in human, they use uh, Normaski differential interference contrast, but they need glass dishes. But with plastic and Hoffman, it works okay. And we use in the past, we begin to use the prime tech uh, piezo, but now we switch to the Eppendorf, which it's easy to set up. And uh, um, you know, because the, it's, a, it's a tricky part of the setting up of the ICSI. And uh, 
you can do ICSI without the piezo, but uh, I think you get better results. You do less damage to the oocyte if you use the piezo. This is how it works. Uh, this arrow will indicate where I will place the sperm uh, at the end of the procedure. <clears throat> so the sperm has been loaded into the pipette into a different drop. Uh, now here we are ready. You see the pipette is cutting through without uh, indenting, without putting any pressure on the oocyte. You're taking out a bit of zona and then you push the sperm to the tip of the pipette and then you go deep into the egg on the opposite side you give a pulse here you break the membrane and the sperm is left there so this is a very neat uh, procedure uh, so every egg uh, that uh, is matured by is detected by the presence of polar body is injected after injection, uh, they go into culture. At day two, uh, we see how many they have cleaved. We remove the, the one that did not cleave, which day four, we replace some of the media, uh, which is soft basis, our modified soft. And then uh, we had uh, on day six and day eight, uh, a different media uh, with uh, some serum at the end. Uh, we start assessing blastocyst formation by day six, uh, seven, and day seven, we see the first blastocyst and we start freezing. Majority of embryos will form blastocyst by day eight. The freezing is done with a conventional method used for cattle to 10% glycerol. Embryos are transferred after thawing to recipients that can be on day three, four, or five of the uh, after ovulation. The freezing we use uh, uh, alcohol bath freezer, and this is a biocool machine, and uh, uh, which is quite reliable in controlling temperature. Now the numbers, uh, um, we have been, uh, uh, as I said, the first uh, work started in 2001. The first 10, 15 years have been you know, less than 100 uh, OPU session per year and they were in sort of developmental phases. Here are data reported from 2014. Uh, and you can see in blue are the OPU session and X that we do here at Avantea. In yellow, the one that uh, are coming from the clinics, shipping on site to us the number of sessions. In green, the total number, so some uh, blue plus yellow, and uh, in uh, orange, the number of frozen embryo. What you can see here is that uh, um, in 2000 and, uh, 17, the number of embryos was less than the number of OPU. This means that we were producing less than one embryo or almost one embryo per OPU session. But starting in 2018, on uh, uh, the number of embryos is clear overtaking the number of OPU session. And now, if you look at 2020, you see that uh, the number of uh, embryos is almost twice the number of uh, uh, OPU or ICSI session. So it means that we are producing two embryos per session. Another information you can see here that from 2019, 2020, the number of sheep uh, uh, ICSI session have outpaced the number that we, from day one that we collect here at Avantia. So it means that the shipping for sites is increasing significantly. And the last information I give you here is that up to June this year, we produce as many, did as many sessions and produce as many embryos as we did the whole year in 2019. So clearly there is uh, an exponential growth in the last uh, four or five years of this uh, technique and uh, the interest in this technique. Some more information, uh, you know, the ship those sites do rather well, you know, comparable to what we get in our, uh, uh, in our laboratory, if you look at the percentage of, uh, well, first look, let's look at the number of uh, oocyte collected. We could recover about 13, the shipped oocyte, which is the sum of all the clinics that are starting, beginners and more advanced, uh, 11, so it's comparable. And the number of, uh, the rate of eggs that make it to blastocyst is 19 versus 17. 
and then uh, the number of uh, uh, embryos per OPU session it's uh, it's uh, two point five versus two, so still we ship outside to get two embryos per session. Uh, experience clearly matters. Uh, this uh, is the data from the clinic uh, in 2020 that shipped our site to uh, us. So those uh, clinics that do more than 100, uh, and there are clinics that do more than 200, or more than 300, you know, the numbers are higher than compared to the clinics that do only less than 20 uh, OPO sessions per year, where they average about five or sites but still get one embryo. So it means that the more eggs you get, the more embryo uh, you obtain. And this was clearly shown by also Tom Stout publication where they looked in more detail at this, uh, at this data. So the more eggs you get, the more likely you are to get an embryo. Uh, the breed, uh, there is some variation due to breeds. Uh, if here we put two extreme, the world blood are the one that are performing better in our end, and the Egyptian Arabians, the one that do less well. Uh, and uh, if you look at the freezable blastocysts per OPU session, this is a data set of uh, almost 2000 OPU and uh, it, uh, 1.7. Uh, compared to 0.74 for Arabians. And uh, sorry, and this is the, the rate of development of eggs, making it into blastocysts here, 13%. This is only almost 6%. <clears throat> and this is a total number of blastocysts, 2.5 versus 1.2 per uh, XC session. Uh, there is also, we see um, moderate age effect. Uh, we divided the donors uh, in four classes. Uh, and these are the number of males that have been through. The most frequent group is the one between 15 to 20 years, brood mares. More than 20 years, only 90 males. And if you look, uh, younger mare gives you more follicles. Uh, uh, and therefore more, more oocytes and also uh, more embryos. But uh, if you look at the, if you calculate the percentage uh, of uh, oocytes turning into blastocyst, older mare, they have, here is about 10%. So 10x, one embryo, here 15x, uh, 2.6. So this is about 17%, this is about 10%. So. We get fewer, uh, fewer embryos, uh, slightly lower developmental rate, but still, you know, you get one embryo per session. Stallion, some information about Stallion. This is data from uh, our colleagues in, in Utrecht. Uh, uh, this is uh, Stallions that have at least four X session, and you see that they most cluster between 15% development up to 25%. There is one that it's performing clearly bad, uh, one uh, moderate, but most of them. So stallion usually is not an issue. Pregnancy rate, uh, uh, you see that uh, in, uh, these are our data in our recipient herd in uh, three years, uh, 700 transfer from warm blood. Uh, first check, we get about 70%, which drops of, uh, to 58 uh, after a day 50. Uh, with Arabians, we have higher losses. Uh, initial lower pregnancy rate and the dropout is about more than 20%. These are some of our testimonials. Uh, some of the men that have been through that uh, didn't produce embryos uh, in any other way. And these are some of the most popular stallion that uh, um, Chaco Blue is not here, but because it doesn't need publicity. Finally, I will just summarize. Uh, there is also the option of sexing the embryo if someone requires, mainly for the Arabians they require ICSI embryo, if you've seen, they tend, if you increase a little bit the culture time, they tend to push out a few cells. So this cells is sufficient for uh, sexing. 
And uh, so you don't need to actually perform a biopsy, just uh, detach this little part of, uh, of the embryo, few cells. And by PCR, we can uh, uh, detect the sex or even uh, some uh, monogenic uh, diseases uh, can be diagnosed uh, by uh, PCR. The future, there will be the option as in cows, probably if, when genomic information will be sufficient for the horse uh, to be able to perform also genomic uh, selection of, uh, of the embryos. So to summarize that I'm a bit over time, uh, I think that uh, assisted reproduction technology has progressed a lot in the last 10 years. And now with more than two embryos per session is really outpacing other, any other uh, assisted reproduction technologies. Uh, being able to exploit more uh, valuable or extremely high quality uh, genetic material, it will increase the level of sport horses. The cryopreservation is really uh, making the difference uh, because it facilitates the trade uh, and safe transfer of genetic material around the world. And also, you know, banking the, the, the embryo for uh, transfer at later stages and uh, so it's really uh, transferring the embryo when the recipient is ready and not when uh, you have the embryo uh, to be transferred. <clears throat> so I will end here. I acknowledge my collaborator, Giovanna Lazzari, Silvia Colleoni, the technical group in the laboratory, and of course the clinic that are shipping and trusting us for producing their embryos. So I think I'll stop here if you have a question. Otherwise, we'll, uh, I don't know what's uh, the- That's great, uh, Cesare. Uh, absolutely brilliant, giving an insight into your world. And wow, I mean, do numbers talk there? Yeah, they really do show the, the sheer volume and how it's changed over the years and your results. One question, I suppose, from my side, and you may have answered it, so forgive me if I didn't hear, is when do you think we'll be able to actually freeze oocytes? Sorry, can you repeat that? When do you think we can freeze oocytes? Well, that would be complicated because uh, they are, uh, you know, you've seen they are darker. They contain a lot of lipids, some of these eggs. Uh, so it will be complicated. Uh, I mean, you can get some results uh, now, but not to the level of efficiency that uh, we can achieve uh, today. Um, and also for a breeder, I, I understand some people won't because they don't even decide what stallion to use, but we would recommend uh, with the current technology to, to freeze, to inseminate a freeze the embryo rather than try to, to vitrify the oocytes. Right, yeah, okay. And um, we've had one the question is, why glycerol for freezing and not ethylene glycol? We experience from the cow world, uh, we have more consistent, uh, less uh, uh, individual variation uh, when we use glycerol compared to uh, glycerol. If, you're, if you use uh, ethylene glycol, so between glycerol is more constant, uh, you have more consistent results. If, and uh, we always been working with that. Uh, this does not allow uh, also glycerol, the direct transfer, so the, the embryo has to be taken out and uh, looked at, uh, washed out uh, from the glycerol. So it also you know, it means that uh, more qualified people have to use and have to do the procedure. And this also the guarantee that uh, you will have a higher standard of uh, handling this embryo by more qualified people rather than you know, a direct transfer that then uh, AI technician will end up doing it. Okay, thank you. There's so many questions coming in. And thank you, uh, James and Katya, for, for answering some of these. That's been great for going along. And so many, if there's any there that you can answer, that'd be great. One, before we move into your lab, uh, it says, does sex in the embryo have any impact on the success rates? Does it harm the, the embryo? <laughs> Um, we are building a number. We haven't got a large number to, um, it doesn't seem to be, to have a major effect, but uh, if there is something is really minor because we, and also because we sex more Arabians that we know that they are, uh, as I shown you already, 
they perform less in pregnancy rate as compared to warm blood. Uh, I think we need more data to, to confirm that, but if anything is minor. In bovine, where you do a biopsy with a blade, you lose about 5% uh, where there is a lot of data available. But then uh, the biopsy in the case of the cattle, it's more invasive here, as you see. Some of the embryo we say the client, we cannot sex. If it doesn't push out uh, the cells for some reason, so because the oil is too small, then we say we cannot sex it. But if it comes out, you know, the removal, it's very minor uh, stress to the embryo. No, great. Well, th thank you very much. So I think we're all dying to have a look around your facility now into, into your lab. So if you if you can uh, yes. switch over to your other, other okay. one, that'd be great. While you're doing that, I'll just go through some of the message we've had amazing we've had people from iraq uh norway nigeria, nigeria canada um uh, germany again um paraguay. yeah martha i think it's from canada paraguay so yes we've got a real international crowd uh tonight uh, coming through um so yeah keep your questions coming uh just one come from belgium now so um and mexico we've had a few from wales as well so there are a few people from the uk we're watching this, which is good uh, on, on that side. Um, Amy, if you can just tell me you have to spot, ah, right, if you can spotlight the tab. So, um, yeah, so this is, yeah, if you talk us through the lab, uh, uh, Cesarine, just how it, how it all works, that would be great. Yes, we're giving a, an overview of the, of the X lab. Do you see, do you hear me? Yeah, we hear you well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so. We go, so we go from the, the beginning when the, the OPU bottle with the media, we use a, a you know, flashing media, which is supplemented with heparin. So the bottle now, of course, uh, eight o'clock in the night and uh, in August, uh, we, we are not working. So I cannot show you live, but uh, the flash media comes in we use uh, filters that are used for embryo collection. Uh, you know, we put them on the, on the stand and then uh, we, the, the bottle, it, the, the collection fluid is filtered through the, through the, the filter, uh, the embryo filter actually the same. If, if there, is, uh, there is always, uh, there is always blood uh, into just, uh, You know the filters are, you can use any MCON or whatever. We prefer to use this one here. Uh, you know, we put them on, 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 we made this little stand so then you open it and uh, pour in the, the, the wash in the, the bottle. And then once you then uh, wash the bottle, then it, it is uh, uh, moved to the, to the microscope for uh, searching the, the outside. Here we... So this is so the very first stages, uh, yeah. uh, We also search your sites and then... Uh, your, your screen's gone blank at the moment. Uh, yes, uh, let's see. That's it, yeah, it's okay now, yeah. Okay. Uh, we picture uh, every off-site uh, set, uh, any you know, of your outcome, it's, uh, it's picture. So then we have the recording of all the, the mares that are collected. If uh, we receive instead uh, the eggs coming from outside, from sheep cleaning there, uh, they come into these vials, bio vials, so then they are taken out and put into the, into the culture dish for, for maturation. Uh, so the maturation is performed uh, in this uh, incubator. We, we mature at uh, 5% CO2 and 38 uh, degrees centigrade. Now, of course, it's empty, the incubator, but this is where uh, uh, the maturation, as I said, is about 26 to 30 hours. So the day then, uh, uh, two days later, 
when the oocytes are collected, we need to prepare the sperm. So the, the straw is brought in into, uh, from the, the biobank uh, into where the thermos with the liquid nitrogen. So then we can uh, throw the embryos in the laboratory. We uh, prepare the gradient. Uh, we use a uh, ready grad. Uh, we make it up uh, around with 90% and 45%. So in this, uh, we then uh, with a pipette uh, put the prepare the gradient and then uh, the semen is stored out in one of these vials and then with a pipette it's put top on the on the on the gradient and then this is centrifuge. Centrifuge uh, 20 minutes, uh, simple centrifuge for 2000 RPM for 20 minutes. Uh, uh, so we can do maybe four or eight cycles depending on the morning. Uh, we can do that, those numbers. Of course, uh, uh, one of the problem is when you have more many studies, is be careful uh, to. Have a clear tracing and identification. So we use a system of color coding so that there is uh, no to try to minimize the risk of making mistakes. And um, so once the sperm is prepared, uh, it's uh, then put into the IVF media in, uh, in this virus and it goes to the incubator. In the meantime, uh, uh, the eggs have been uh, denuded and prepared for uh, for ICSI and uh, so the eggs come to, to another microscope uh, here where well, it's close to the sterile microscope close to the uh, injection uh, microscope which is an inverted sterile uh, inverted uh, microscope with uh, a warm stage you see this glass is a warm stage and this is a dish uh, with a drop in there uh, covered with oil, and you can see the this one on the left hand side is the holding pipette, uh, which uh, we can see then on the screen. This is the holding, and this is the injection. Then the thin pipette, which will pick up the sperm and inject it. And this is the piezo uh, uh, device, is the one that gives the pulse to the pipette. But you can see, if you can see on the, so this is the and this is the uh, now we don't have any action going on, but it's uh, and the so the eggs are inside the this drop. This is a mid lower magnification, so the eggs will be in those drops. And uh, so the pipette on the left hand side will suck and hold the eggs, and the other one will inject the sperm. Once uh, this is completed, uh, the eggs go back to the culture dishes, uh, which are put then in different incubators, which uh, uh, besides CO2, they control also oxygen. So this uh, fed, uh, there is a line of uh, uh, gas, gas phase of uh, nitrogen, which is connected to our liquid nitrogen storage. And uh, you know the culture is done in four well dishes. Uh, so in each uh, four well, we put two mare each, uh, each well. And so then they will stay 48 hours and we take them out and the sterile microscope remove and found the cleave, uncleave one. Then they go back, uh, as I said, on day four, they get fed uh, and then they go back on day six, we start checking for injury development. Uh, and we start freezing on day seven. And they, the freezing is done uh, with picture of the illusion of the angels that are frozen. They go back to the stereo microscope and they are pictures. So we, are, we can track uh, any indoor that any clinic we receive, we have a picture of it. And if there are questions or issues, or we can always go back and, uh, and retrieve. Uh, uh, what was the embryo in that saw? And, uh, um, so that's uh, about, uh, about it. Uh, yeah, that's 
that's really good to see around. Uh, James or Katya or Neve, you know, have you have you got any questions uh, while we're in the in the lab there? There are probably so many questions. To I know. Answer, that's what I thought. That, uh, just, just we would sap <laughs> Cesare of all of his <laughs> answers. Um, but yeah, congratulations! A wonderful facility and some fabulous equipment and clearly a nicely laid out laboratory as well. You've obviously used a lot of experience in laying out your laboratory so that it flows. Yeah, well, as I show you, we, I started, uh, it's, it's a lifetime uh, work. We started uh, when I graduated. So it's uh, more than 30, almost 35 years that uh, I'm involved in this activity uh, together with also Giovanna Lazza, my, my partner. And, uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's been built up uh, with time and experience and uh, many details. Uh, it's a work about details, and if you put don't put together all the details, you you know you just miss one step, and then everything falls apart. And so, so, so. so when you have when you have a busy day, uh, to, you know, like to, you push it through. I mean, what's the sort of capacity? How many can you handle in one day? oversights coming in? We can, uh, well, it, if it's, uh, I think we can do XC of about uh, 40, 45 uh, mats one day. And we have three people, we have another microscope uh, here to see two X stations, but we have another two on the next uh, room laboratory. So we, we can have at least three people at the same time doing XC, but you need uh, as many uh, cleaning the eggs and as many preparing, no, not as many, but a few to prepare the semen. So it's a real, you know, it starts uh, six or seven o'clock in the morning and you end up at the uh, same time in the evening. And uh, what uh, complicates is when uh, you have a full uh, working week, uh, that because the following week you have the embryo to freeze. So in one day, you not only have to do the X, but you start freezing the embryo. And so that's uh, overlaps and uh, create complications. That's why we're building a new, new facility because we need more space so that we can a little bit separate and, and uh, the two parts. And so then we can uh, cover, with, we do, can do more X throughout the week. Uh, uh, and do freezing at the same time in a, in a separate laboratory. Yeah, and, and when's your new place going to be ready? Uh, well, for uh, the mass, for collecting mass, it will be October, and the laboratory we hope before Easter next year. Mm, very good. Um, I think that's absolutely great. Any, any burning questions, we can always come back to you, unless anybody's got anything they want to say. but. Uh, Cesare, I really, really appreciate being able to look around you. I can speak from our, all the comments coming in now. Everyone's really appreciates being shown around there. It's very much, no one's really heard, obviously heard about what you do, but they've very rarely seen behind, behind the scenes and what actually goes on uh, there. So you've given people a great experience uh, really all over the world tonight to see what, what's it like behind one of the biggest uh, ICSI uh, lab setups in the world. So we really, really appreciate that. Um, so thank you for that indeed. Um, you're very obviously welcome to, to stay on. Uh, I'll, it's entirely up to you if you want to go back to your computer, whichever, whichever you find easy uh, on that. Yes. Uh, um, that 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 would be great. Uh, on, if you on, don't on. need the phone anymore, the camera can go back to the computer. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Okay. Yeah. So disconnect from here. Yes, that'd be fine. Yeah, go back to the desk. Um, we just got one poll question. It's always quite interesting when we're running these. Uh, it's just to see how many people are watching tonight uh, are in the veterinary uh, uh, field side. So if there's a poll question here. Uh, if you could just uh, put in whether yes, you are, uh, no, you're not, or I, uh, uh, I work in the veterinary field, but I'm not a veterinarian. It's always quite good to, 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 to see that side of things. Um, so we're on to uh, Neve now. Um, Neve, if you're there, um, Neve's—I don't know how many years it is. It seems quite quite a while ago when you were um, doing your PhD uh, with us, um, or to say next door with my brother. Um, 
and go on, all the trials and tribulations that you have to go through getting all the oocytes to, to get to that stage uh, the work to be able to do it is was was quite enormous um but yeah it'd be really just quite nice to hear about obviously experiences and obviously some of the the, the basic anatomy of of, of 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 what you're you're doing uh with sort of the ovaries the follicles and the eggs uh, that'd be great to hear Excellent. Thank you so much, Tullis, um, for the invitation to be here and hello to everybody all over the world and lots of familiar names popping up and um, familiar faces in the panel and everything. And um, so I've been tasked with some really kind of basic biology to get everybody um, up to speed and on the same page. So a lot of you um, would have been good to know the answer to the poll before I started because um, to see how many people are vets and how many people aren't. Um, but I think even some vets, hopefully there'll be some little nuances of the reproductive physiology that um, you needed a refresher on. Um, and if not, it's always nice to hear it again, as it's such an interesting area of reproduction. So just to get, again, get us all up to speed with the lingo, a lot of people will know this already. So when we talk about eggs, we can also call them oocytes um, or ova. And of course, um, OPU, uh, the O in that stands for the ovum. And again, we have two ovaries at the very top. We're gonna to take a Russian doll approach to this. Um, each ovary has a lot of follicles, hopefully. Um, and then each follicle does contain one oocyte. So that's a question I get asked very often um, by clients is, you know, does each follicle contain, um, contain an oocyte? So each follicle should contain one. And where is all this located? Let's take a bird's eye view of the whole process. Obviously it's the caudal reproductive tract and the ovaries are paired, attached to the oviducts of the mare, attached to the uterine horns, the cervix, vagina and vestibule. Now, if we wanna image these ovaries and um, when we're doing OPU, obviously we place the vagin or the- Steve, just to, to let you know the answer to the question, it's 60% vets, 30% uh, layman on this. Perfect. Oh yeah. 60, 32 and seven, sorry. Yeah, there, it's up on your screen now actually, yeah. Okay, excellent. So the 60% will be totally with me on this, which is excellent. And some of the 32%, um, hopefully this will be some insight for. Um, so yeah, we obviously vis uh, visualize the ovary through either the rectum or the vagina. And if we look back at the tail of the mare, you can see that the ovaries are suspended um, from the dorsal body wall. And a closer look at those ovaries, the average size, seven to eight centimeters. Obviously lots of shapes and sizes they can come in. And um, for me, I've not got very big hands. So I prefer if I can fit the ovary in my hand um, and there isn't a large pre follicle or a large um, structure on the ovary, which makes it very difficult for me to stabilize. And um, when we cut that open and look inside the follicle, obviously we have um, a mixture of follicles and corpus um, lutea, depending on the cycle stage. When we look a little bit at follicular genesis, just to give you some context of when we do OPU and why, um, we've got the follicular fluid and the follicular cells, theca, granulosa, and those very specialized granulosa cells um, called accumulus cells, which are attached to that oocyte, and of course the oocyte itself. When we um, think of follicular genesis, um, the mare or the filly foal is born with all her oocytes and they're contained in these primordial follicles, which you see in the left-hand side of your picture. Now, whenever puberty occurs at around 15 months, that's actually the kickoff of the follicular activity. And those um, primordial follicles will grow through primary into the secondary stage where they will form an antrum. And the antrum is just that it will fill with fluid and then we can obviously visualize it on our ultrasound scanner. Um, when the mare um, is under lights and is on seasonal reproduction pattern, actual cyclicity will occur and we will get ovulation and the formation of pre-ovulatory follicles during that time. And when we want to do OPU is when we have lots and lots of these antral follicles. And um, obviously, as Cesare said, you know, often you have to take, um, take what you get. And when we do OP, one of the questions actually came in, I can answer it now. Um, we can do open pickup in mature pre-ovulatory follicles, but with the shipping and the timing of ICSI, um, when we use a service like Aventea, we always like to get the immature follicles, which then can be timed specifically to be optimum for ICSI um, at the time when they reach um, Aventea after a period of overnight holding plus the maturation period. 
And um, if we got an oocyte that was pre-ovulatory, it'd be very difficult to transport it. One, because um, actually when the oocyte resumes meiosis, the DNA can be quite unstable. So temperature becomes much, much more important. Um, and it would be very difficult to transport that oocyte. And then also the exact timing of ICSI would be very difficult to determine um, based on when the pre-ovulatory drugs were given and the transport time needed. So again, when you're doing shipped oocytes for ICSI, um, we collect immature um, oocytes. And again, they're contained in this cumulus oocyte complex, which is the oocyte plus those specialized follicular cells um, known as cumulus. Now, I just wanted to give you a little context again on size, because this is something that baffles me every time I get an oocyte out of a follicle. And um, if you think about it, the oocyte itself, and um, this is it stripped of its cumulus cells. We've got the oolema, um, which is the coating of that cytoplasm of the oocyte. And um, that's where the DNA is contained, all the organelles, the cytoplasmic machinery. We have the zona pellucida, which is the hard coating around the outside. And then you can see here some um, attached cumulus cells to the outside. Now, this whole structure in diameter from zona to zona is around 150 microns. Um, again, for context, a coffee ground is around 100 microns. We can barely see that with our eye. And the tip of a pencil is 1,000 microns. So again, if we think of the surface area even of a 5 millimeter follicle, the internal surface area is around 78 millimeters, and that's 78,000 microns. And if you increase that to the 35 millimeter, you're over 3 million microns. So as Cesare mentioned, obviously it's a lot easier to get the oocytes out of the smaller follicles than it is of the large one, because it basically is target practice. You've got a 12 gauge needle, and what you want to do is you want to try and hit the spot and detach that cumulus oocyte complex from the wall of the follicle. So the larger the follicles, just statistically speaking, the less chance you have of the 12 gauge needle and um, touching that oocyte. So hopefully that's a really brief overview and, and got the kind of the 30% or the 10% of the 30% up to speed with what everybody's talking about. And there's nobody sitting in the back of the audience that's not sure um, of the lingo, so to speak. Um, and yeah, I'd be more than happy to talk about the experiences. I think we started in 2012 down this process um, and I'm just about to embark on starting it all, all, all over again um, in UCD in Dublin. So um, yeah, it's been a, a few years uh, in the process. So yeah, over to Katja about what happens next and I'll leave the biology behind. Thank, uh, you, very much. thank you very much, Neil. Well, I think you've been making babies yourself, haven't you? That's why you've had a, a break from this, but you're coming <laughs> back. Uh, 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 it's great to get you back because your knowledge uh, will be absolutely fantastic. And, and uh, it'd be great to obviously when you get set up in Ireland to be able to do this. One, one question that's come in was, uh, what's the best time? I think I know the answer to this. What's the best time of year to do ICSI with mares? So as Cesare will agree with, I think their data shows that actually the time, as long as the mare has enough follicles, there's no ideal time of year. And um, it's a little bit easier to time the mares when they're not cycling in terms of having a pre-ovulatory follicle present. Um, and then whenever they're in spring or fall transition, they tend to have those multi-follicular ovaries. Um, but at any time of the year, if they have the right number of follicles, um, you, you can do OPU. And their results, as I understand, are exactly the same, um, de not depending on month. Yeah, well, well thank you, Neve, uh, for that. It's great. And as I say, I, I really, I knew all the hard work that you went through years ago to achieve that first fold. On the, what was she called in the end? I can't remember what she was called. Uh, it was a boy and it was called Twixie. Yeah. What's it called? Twixie, Twemlow's little Ixie. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All the hard work that went behind that. So thank you very much. Uh, so now on to our uh, next uh, panellist, uh, Katja uh, from Sussex Equine. And I know, Katja, you've been doing OPU now for, for well, you'll be explained quite a few years, but you've been, I think you've gone from naught to 60 incredibly quickly, hasn't it? It's been, uh, there was no, from what I can gather, no real slow period. It just went bang. I mean, that many people wanted it. Uh, I know you were virtually had waiting lists at some point uh, for the days that you had to do, because you can only... Can you just talk us through, I know you've got a presentation, but it'd be nice to know there's certain days that you can do it on a certain days you can't and things like that. But, but yeah, it'd be great to hear your experiences on the OPU side. 
Yeah, we do. Thank you. Yeah, we do it uh, Mondays and Tuesdays just to be able to ship the other sites on time to, to Italy and to avoid for the people in Italy and Avantia to, to work in Sunday, on Sundays. And um, so, yeah, we do it on Mondays and Tuesdays. And yeah, um, I'm just going to find my presentation. And... So, um, yeah, well, I had a, a great introduction for, for my talk um, from Avanti, and it was very nice to see uh, Cesare's lab as well as uh, the presentation of Neef. Um, and so I'm just going to go and give you an introduction on how the open pickup is actually uh, performed. And I'm going to keep it uh, quite basic just because we have a bit of a mixed audience. Um, sorry, just. So we, we will scan the mare at home to just perform, to see how many um, follicles are present. Ideally, you would have about 10 follicles larger than one centimeter, but in all the mares, they sometimes have only five or six um, follicles. So we will perform the ovum pickup um, anyway, and with um, acceptable results. The health testing, James will speak about that later, so I won't go into that. So I will speak about the actual ovum uh, picker procedure. And as you see, it's quite a teamwork where here um, Simon is holding actually the ovary and the ultrasound probe, whereas I'm um, manipulating the needle. And it's a bit like dancing. You kind of need to feel what the other one is doing because um, uh, while I will be scraping, Simon will as well uh, move the ovary. So you kind of really need to trust each other and understand without actually speaking what you will be doing. Uh, for preparation, we use um, the tamadin and butorphanol and um, we use actually a CRI for the mare. So they are in a constant kind of um, same level of sedation. I personally don't use an epidural. Um, we scrub the perineum, obviously, to just have everything clean. We use broad spectrum antibiotics and um, non steroidal and buscopan as well. And I think important um, not to forget is put a urinary catheter in your mare because it will make her more relaxed if she doesn't need to be, and it will help you a lot if she's not wiggling constantly. Um, so how is the open pickup actually performed? If you see here, um, it's actually quite a small follicle, but the needle is advanced into the follicle, the fluids, the content is aspirated. And once the follicle is collapsed, the needle will be moved as well as the ovary will be moved to in order to scrape the follicular wall. And then it is filled up again with um, um, recovering medium. And this is performed about five to 10 times per follicle. And as you see here, um, this is why we actually need to scrape and, and certain women, uh, some women might have undergone um, IVF and in women you really just aspirate the follicle and the, the oocyte will be released. However, in horses, um, there is a tight attachment that's going to scrape the follicle in order to get that oocyte out. And then just, I'll just have a little video going over all the equipment that is needed. Um, and one, of course, is an ultrasound scan. And instead of normally, yeah, you have your rectal probe, we'll use um, a microconvex probe, which um, is one of those. And this is placed in a probe extend, uh, extension. So in here, it's just a cable, and it makes it possible um, to use um, transvaginally without uh, needing to hold the ovary there. So um, then you have as well here, the metal bit here, uh, this bit from here to there is what we call a needle guide. And then in the needle guide, the needle goes. And then, so basically it will come out from there. And this um, is a 12 gauge needle, um, it's about 60 centimeters. And it's what we call a double lumen needle. So basically it has an inner needle, this one, and that will contain, um, the inner needle will be connected to a vacuum pump. So the pump will aspirate the contents of the follicle and hopefully as well the, uh, the egg by the inner needle. And as I said earlier, we need to flush that um, that follicle as well in order to um, enhance the chance of, of retrieving that oocyte out of the follicle. 
and that flushing happens by the outer needle. So it's connected here. And if you look closely to the needle here, you'll see that it's beveled and it will help you with scraping the follicular wall. So that's the needle. And the needle, so the needle goes into the needle guide and as you see here this tubing connected and one of the tubes is connected to our flushing medium. Um, this is a special um, oven pickup recovering medium. You can use um, embryo recovering medium as well but then you need to add heparin. Um, and if you do use um, embryo recovery medium and you use heparin, make sure you use um, heparin without uh, preservatives. Um, we use a two-piece syringe, so without um, without a rubber. Um, so, as you see here, that is connected to your outer needle and will flush the follicle. And then the end of the, uh, the inner needle is then connected to, to a collection of uh, either um, falcon tubes or bottles. Um, and in here you will have then the fluid that is coming from the follicles together with hopefully all your oversides. Um, and then the, um, uh, the pump, the vacuum pump that is connected here, um, needs to be set at um, 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 yeah, people ask often what are the settings. Basically, you need to have a settings where you have about 20 to 25 milliliter aspirated per minute. If you have it higher, um, you will denude your oocytes, you'll remove uh, the outer cells of your oocyte of your egg, and that will be, um, could have a negative effect on, on, your, um, on your maturation rate and so actually your, your um, embryo production. Or if it's too low, then you will not have enough suction and you will not have enough um, chance. Uh, uh, you have a lower chance of retrieving that oversight. So I'm just going to show you how this looks on, on, on ultrasound. If we look here, um, so we're looking here on the ultrasound and if you have this dotted line. And so if I just put up. Um, so basically what it is, this is coming like that. So you have your dotted line here. So you have your dotted, this is your ultrasound image. You have your dotted line, which is, from, uh, is um, actually following the line that will needle once it comes out of your needle guide. So if we put this, um, freeze this. If we put it just in water, just to make you um, understand this. So we'll have, um, Again, here, this is your ultrasound image. Um, you have your dotted line there. And if you just keep, the needle will come from here. So if you keep an eye on there, you'll see the needle coming. And that actually helps you a lot with knowing where your needle is and um, makes it safer for uh, the horse as well as the veterinarian. And so that is how, what we need and how it's done. Some diagrams because once I'm inside there, there's nothing to see anymore from you. So basically, uh, we made uh, some diagrams. This is looking from above. Um, so the tail of the mare is there, the head is there, and so you have the vulva here, um, the stigma and vagina. This is the cervix, so the entrance to the uterus, and then we have two uterine horns, two ovaries, and as you can see, you have two dead spaces here. Um, of the vaginal wall and that will be interesting later on. So um, bottom picture is a picture from the side. So again, head there, tail there. In blue we have the rectum and red again the um, reproductive tract. So um, with the vulva here, the stable and vagina, cervix, uterus with an ovary and in green the bladder. Um, so People often ask, so where do you put um, uh, the probe? And normally we all are uh, familiar with rectal scanning, where you put rectally, you take your probe, and then you can just go over the uterus, ovary, and image everything. So you'll just go like that, but it will be through the rectum, and you'll be able to image the whole reproductive tract. Obviously, uh, for many reasons, um, we can't do that if we want to retrieve oversights because it would um, um, wouldn't be 
in my stem or what do. So we go plant the child. But if you see this image, the ovary, so we would bring the scanner in through the vagina here, and we bring it against the vagina wall, either here or there, so the fornix were next to the surface. However, as you can see, the ovary is more towards the head. But we can grab the ovary, and I just the whole thing made one so we can grab the ovary through the rectum so you have one hand holding this one and another hand will be rectally and grabs the ovary and moves it accordingly so to the to the back against this the vaginal wall and then you need to make sure on your ultrasound image that there is nothing in between, so you don't have any folds or rectal, uh, so intestine here, or you don't go through the uterus and you have uterus um, um, sitting in between. So there it is important uh, to know your ultrasound image well. So you take your ovary, grab it, hold it here, and what then happens is that you need to find one of those follicles. And you want to bring that follicle in front of that dotted line that I showed before, because you want to po uh, be able to poke the needle into one of those follicles. So what you do is either you can move the scanner or you can twist the ovary in order to align. But as you can see now, I'm, I'm lacking a bit of hands. So one vet will do this, and some vets do it all by themselves, we do it with two, where a second vet will actually advance, um, advance the needle, and we'll so the second vet will then, once the ovary is placed, will advance the needle into the follicle, so you go through the vaginal wall into the follicle and once you're in the follicle you'll aspirate the fluids out and once it's collapsed so you'll go in and once it's collapsed you will move the needle around so you, so you scrape the follicular wall uh, and then you will fill it up again with uh, follicular uh, with um, recovery medium and, um, and then I will aspirate and repeat uh, the scraping. And so you do that about 10 times. And whilst you're there, and you're done with one follicle, you will manipulate the ovary again, and you align another follicle and you repeat the procedure. So, um, sorry, we just sharing there we go so basically that is how the open picker procedure is done um we go to the lab and search the oversights and the oversights are then um shipped to Avantia but it is a uh, um, more james's stock so so yeah that, that's my talk for this evening and i'm more than happy to answer any questions that are there um yeah thank thank you uh catch you on that do you do the mayors do they get any complications while after taking their oversights or are they is it fairly um it does um so some um there are some complications reported um but they are very rare um i think in one one in 450 and mares but comp uh, because you're going rectally um rectal tears are an op uh, are a possibility um, so I uh, just hear um, rectal tears, peritonitis. Um, there's been some reports from hemorrhage, either bleeding from a vessel in the vaginal wall or of the free. Um, ovarian abscesses have been um, reported as well, or, or needle puncture of the rectum. This is actually a picture that was sent to me, and somebody asked me what this was, and it's actually a puncture through the rectum. Uh, the mayor was absolutely fine after that, um, and they had um, uh, the majority of those complications are, are uh, managed okay. Um, and often people as well ask if uh, the multiple ovum pickup uh, sessions do they have an influence on on future fertility? Um, and actually, no, that it doesn't because um, they seem to to to, to um, 
handle those those punctures very well as well as the follicles that are there um were tend to were determined to get um to to to, to die anyway so basically you have a follicular wave and um those follicles will develop and if they don't um, ovulate they will regress and then a new wave will come so you want to deplete the ovary neither um, but yeah there have been some complications with ovary pickup in need. and and um i suppose you've virtually answered the question then so when you aspirate the these follow these follicles and get the other sites out how quickly can you if you want to do that mare again how long do you have to leave or is it down to the individual mare slightly that on the age of the mare and everything else and time of year or is there a certain time period you tend to leave them before you can aspirate them again? We, um, in general, look at them again after two weeks, um, just scan them again, and then the earliest they, in general, come back is three weeks. Um, and so we had some mares that came every three weeks to us um, with um, good success as well. Um, interesting to know as well is that mares that one, were successful once are more likely to be successful the next time as well. So it's just quite some repetitivity in there. And um, some mares they need uh, after one open pickup session, maybe two months in order to develop more follicles. And it will depend as well indeed of the season. If she had an open pickup session, maybe at the end of, of October, no well, November, it may take her a bit longer than if she was in um, the beginning of the like February, March, it might give, uh, she might have uh, had a bit of faster follicular development there. Great. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Katja. Uh, a really good presentation. And it's great to, you know, the way you demonstrate in that video, you obviously are, are very good at your, got your RSO level as well, or your, your qualification, because the drawings made it. Uh, I know we're trying to find a way to simplify it. And I thought that was absolutely spot on. The drawings uh, were poor last. Mine looked very good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, even for my, my simple brain, I, I could work that out. And we've had, uh, you know, I've had a few people saying, thanks, Katja. You know, again, we've had some from USA, Egypt, uh, Uruguay, uh, or Sudan, even so, we've, you know, uh, um, so we've had right. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, somebody, I think it was Adele, that's it, Adele, uh, who's a Brit in uh, Colorado, who's raising Suffolk punches as well. She's put a uh, hello mm -hmm. for the Dominican Republic, but anyway, thank you very much for that, Katya. Um, uh, uh, really appreciate that, and um, yeah, there might be some more questions to follow. Um, so moving on from now, as I say, you know. We, we couldn't do this present these, this um, webinar really without, without sponsorship and Cooper Surgical uh, of, the, of the, the main headline sponsors and Steve Trooper I've known for quite some time. He, Steve was very much involved with me for many years and helping uh, with, with, I think, with that, that side of things, getting uh, with the, the, the first uh, um, ICSI that we were doing many years ago, I believe. I might, that might may or may not be wrong, but I think you were involved with that side of it. So it'd be great to hear about... Uh, Steve, um, and you are a representative or uh, as a consultant for Cooper Surgical and obviously sells the equipment uh, side of things. So over to you, Steve. Hey, well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Tullis, um, for the very kind invitation to, to, to speak to you tonight. Um, I have to say it's absolutely fascinating watching um, the, the, the three previous presentations from, from Neve and Catcher and uh, it's it's incredible to see um, Cesare's lab. Uh, you know, we've talked about it for, for a long time, but uh, what would also be even more incredible would, would be to see his new lab. I'd love to see that when it's uh, when it's up and running. Um, but I'd, I'd just like to spend a few minutes telling you about my experience with Equine ICSI. Um, firstly, I, I must make it clear that I am by no means an Equine ICSI expert, uh, certainly compared to the rest of the panel this evening. Um, but I have spent my entire career working as a, as a clinical embryologist in, in the field of human assisted conception. And I've spent much of my time um, trying to optimize lab systems to get human IVF to work um, as well as it possibly can. And as a cell biologist by training, I certainly think that some of the advances that have been made in human IVF labs um, such as, you know, improved culture conditions, time-lapse imaging, um, and more recently, the use of artificial intelligence 
can, can be applied to all mammalian embryo uh, culture, including, of course, the, in, in the equine world. Um, for the, oops, got two laptops going here. For the, um, uh, for the latter part of my career, I was, uh, I was lucky enough to um, have held the position as the scientific director at Liverpool Women's Hospital's Hewitt Fertility Centre, which is one of the largest um, providers of assisted conception services in, in the UK. And it was while I was there that I had the pleasure of, of meeting Tullis and, and his brother Edward. Um, when we were approached to see if we'd like to take part or to form part of a, um, something called a knowledge transfer partnership um, with the University of Liverpool uh, and, and with Twemlow Stud Farm, um, aimed at establishing an equine ICSI programme. And uh, this is where I, I, I first met Neve as well. And the, the approach we took then was to combine the, if you like, the equine expertise in, in the form of Neve, um, and, and also um, I think Caroline Argo, who was your supervisor for your PhD, Neve, um, together with the ICSI, human ICSI and embryology expertise in the form of uh, a colleague of mine called Karen Schnaufer. But um, also importantly, to try and mimic as far as possible, some of the key features of, of the human um, ICSI lab and to try and transfer that um, in, in order to, to make this process, which was notoriously difficult work. And um, to, cut, to cut a long story short, uh, we, we were successful, as has been mentioned a couple of times, um, not only in, in generating the first ever time-lapse uh, images of, of early equine embryo development, but also, as you can see, and as was mentioned before, uh, producing Twixy, which I, I understand was the first ICSI conceived foal in the UK for, for over 15 years. Um, and I, I must just say, for those of you interested in, in the lab detail here, um, it's noteworthy that this was achieved without the use of the, of the piezo drill, which, which Cesare mentioned uh, earlier. Um, in human ICSI, we don't use uh, piezo drills at all. So um, I now work uh, independently and I've spent um, a lot of my time over the last couple of years working quite closely with, with Cooper Surgical on a number of different projects. Um, and I was intrigued to receive a call from Cooper Surgical asking me if I might like to help Equus Vets establish an equine ICSI laboratory. Um, and to be honest, I was even more pleased because it, it gave me an opportunity to get out between the two lockdowns to go and see their, uh, their facility in, um, uh, in Devon. Um, so I, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, I've spent all of my career um, working in high grade clean rooms, um, sterile operating theatres. So um, I must admit, and although this will be no surprise to most of the people on, on, on this meeting, um, it certainly was a bit of a shock to me when I was, when I was shown where, where the new ICSI lab was going to go. Um, but nevertheless, we, um, we devised a, uh, a concept for how the lab might work. And um, I approached a company that I'd used previously for um, for human uh, IVF lab construction, who essentially offer a, um, almost a turnkey solution whereby the lab is manufactured um, almost in kit form off-site uh, and then constructed and validated on-site. Um, and I'm delighted to show you these images of, of, of the new um, Equus, Vets, Equus Vets ICSI lab um, and uh, some of the equipment which Cooper Surgical has supplied. Um, so here is the, the lab itself. This is, I think, this photograph has been taken with a, a, a fisheye lens. So the lab is actually rectangular, um, not this shape. But um, you can see it's a beautiful clean room um, with not a piece of straw in sight, which is very important uh, as far as I'm concerned. And um, here we have uh, a member of the team using the, um, the new high-tech safety cabinet with built-in heated stages, et cetera. Uh, and on the right, one of the latest um, uh, benchtop incubators, as, as they're generally called. Um, and, and this is an interesting uh, possible advancement because 
uh, in the human world, these have been shown to give better outcomes um, than uh, the, the slightly more old fashioned box incubators, um, probably because they are more stable in terms of the environment that they produce. And here, of course, crucially, getting to grips with um, one of the, the very latest Integra um, ICSI rigs. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stop there um, and take this opportunity um, to, to wish Equus Vets and anybody else that's trying to do this every success in the future with, with their Equine ICSI programme. Um, I think, and thanks again to Tullis for, for inviting me to take part. I'll just finish by saying that... Um, there are remarkable similarities between what you guys do and, and what I've done for most of my career. And I think a lot of the audience will be surprised at how similar the techniques are. Um, I guess one of the differences, though, is that apart from the fact that your, your needles are a lot bigger, um, one of the differences is that every single human IVF centre in the world now does ICSI routinely. Um, and to give you some idea of the scale here in the UK, about a third of all the cycles that are, that are done on humans um, involve ICSI, and that equates to round about 30,000 cycles a year um, here, just here in the UK alone. So thanks again to Liz. Um, this is fascinating. I guess it's always fascinating hearing about animals, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Steve, for that. It's great to see the sort of work you've done in the past and and and, and obviously uh, where it's going. Um, and yeah, I think we can very much see it's going to in in the equine world and maybe even for other species you, you can see uh, the way it's going. So when do you think this is going to be up and running? This this lab. Uh, well, as you, as you can see, the lab's there. Um, I think they've still got a bit of construction work to do around the lab. So the you know the the um, the stocks and that that type of thing to be able to do the uh, the opus etc but uh, i don't think it's far off at all okay well thank you very much indeed i really appreciate appreciate supporting tonight as well uh, on, on that so thank you steve uh for, for that um and we've got dennis from from belgium said hello we've got somebody else to see the same brilliant loving the, the webinar and lectures so we're moving on to James Crabtree now um, from Equine Reproduction Services up in Yorkshire. We've had somebody actually asking about Yorkshire, uh, where to do this. So I think you've got somebody just down the road that's actually been asking to do this, James. Uh, and also Mohammed. Do you remember Mohammed from Egypt, Sir James? I do indeed. Yes, I'm he's Mohammed. very much said hello to everybody. So hello, Mohammed in, in, in Egypt as well. So um, uh, it's really great to see you. And thank you, James, for coming on tonight. Um, you've been obviously uh, doing this, you know, pick this up as, and been doing this for, is it a couple of years now and started shipping uh, oversights to Italy. I know we, I think you're going to come on to it, but some of the issues that we've had with the sort of the traveling and the, and the problem shipping and the, 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 them out there. Um, but, uh, you know, how have you found the X6 or the OPU experience in your eyes? Uh, and uh, you... Well, the, the OPU experience, it, it's been a long journey. Um, it started probably about 10 years ago. Um, you know, my previous uh, colleague and, and the, the previous business owner, Jonathan Pycock, you know, performed this technique right back in the day when he was at Utrecht. And, you know, we've had the, the skill to be able to perform this procedure for a long time. But for, for us in Yorkshire, part of it required a total redevelopment and a, and a, a move to a new site. So in order to collect oocytes and ship those oocytes to Italy, you have to be uh, a DEFRA approved embryo collection team that requires a certain base. And for many years, we were, we were, we were ambulatory. We serviced clients on studs and we, we, we parapatetically, if you like, and we didn't have a base. So um, I broke all the piggy banks, uh, invested my life savings in a new facility so that we could then stand alone and, and offer this as a commercial service and have, have driven it on from there, really. Um, and actually, on that, I'll, I'm just going to show you if everybody, Tullis, if you can just confirm my screen sharing is working. Um, yeah, I'm just your, bank, your bank details have just come up there, James, for some Oh, marvellous. <laughs> Oh, you're right. You are scared of your screen, but you're okay. Yeah, yeah and I know you right. built an amazing place there. And I know what I know what it feels like to sort of borrow things up and uh, 
to, to start afresh. Wow. Uh, I do need to pick you up on one thing, Tullis. You, uh, Equine Reproduction Supplies is your company. Equine oh, did I say supplies? Services no, I is, is our yeah, company. Yeah. I was just giving them a quick plug at the same time. Yeah, indeed, indeed. So this was this is where this was just this evening. It started to rain, so I had to be quite quick. But this is uh, some turnout paddocks. That's our barn. Um, this is out front of the practice. I'm just going to walk across to the barn to shut my boot before it gets wet. Um, but we're in a lovely position in Yorkshire, just outside Malton. And I'll just go into the barn here. So this was all sort of bespoke to our design. Um, uh, we have a stallion collection facilities um, and th this barn can house 12 mares. Hello, ladies. How are you doing? Um, we have facilities here. These are our stocks. This is where we would perform our OPU procedure. Um, and then walking out, that's our isolation block. And we're just going to nip over to uh, the offices are on the right. So all of the traffic goes through that building and the uh, facility here with the lab is on the left. So wearing masks and social distancing, all very important, of course. Um, so this is our area, a little triage area through there is our store. And then in here on the left is the, uh, is the lab. So it's DEFRA approved for semen collection and a, an embryo collection team. And we have a little viewing window. So I can't see a great deal there. I might have to just turn the light on. Um, so this is where the lab, so everybody can watch what's going on without actually being in there which is helpful. So if I just, I'm going to take you into the lab. That's incredibly impressive. I have to admit, James, you know, I, I keep meaning to come up there, but I know you've been planning this for quite some time, but really, really impressed with those facilities. We've got some great places. I know Sussex, they've built a new place and you built a new place up here. So it's great. Oh, right. Yeah. So we, we have to get dressed. So appropriate footwear. We, we wear scrubs in the lab. I've got a long hair and a beard, so I need to uh, wear a, a mask and a, a hairnet. Um, but that's the overview. So and next, I'll just take you in the lab. Um, yeah, it's a problem. I don't know. There must have been some interference or something. So yeah. I get hooked up on the, uh, we have a sticky floor mat to take any anything off the bottom of your feet. Uh, so this is us in the lab. So the, the large structure to the right is a, is a laminar flow hood. So a lot of our work searching for oocytes is done under here. Um, we and turn that on and that processes the air through the room and it's very much designed to protect the products that are under the in the workspace so that it's far less likely for any dust or material to drop in and get mixed with the products there's a heated stage in there and um, everything is on hand that we need and and this is um we are going to talk a little bit about thawing the embryos when they come back so this is our embryo tank um 10 different uh goblets there for different clients. I'm just going to have a look in here. Um, and we've got that's four different embryo codes for 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 four different uh, OPU sessions. Um, this is another client and they uh, we've transferred all of theirs. So there's none left in there. So anyway, I won't dilly dally there. So I'll put the lid back in. So the, the embryo tank is temperature monitored, um, linked to the internet, because obviously they're hugely important and 100 and Minus 185.99 degrees, they're, they're stored out there, submerged in liquid nitrogen. And they come back from Aventier in these canes. So the embryo is in a straw, which is sat inside those canes, and they've got embryo codes on the top. So everything's coded and labeled. I've just turned the uh, goblets around so you can't see the names of the mares, obviously. Um, stereo microscope here, we have a nice fixed camera as Cesare was saying we try to take pictures of everything so that we can document it. Uh, and this is our little workspace. It does double up um, at different times of year. So we do have, um, oh yeah, so here micro pipettas and things for accurate volume measuring. Um, we have a nice um, fluorescent microscope. We don't do any staining in the room and then a routine microscope, which we use for some of the semen processing. What else have we got in here? Um, I stick protocols and things that we need. Timers, you know, timing is very important when it comes to thawing embryos as well. So we've got some timers on the wall there. And then we've got a, access to fridge and freezers for all of the materials that we require. And I'm just going to pull out one of the uh, Avantia thawing kits that we use. So it's best when you're using a center that are you know, producing the embryos and freezing them, 
we we get the thawing kits from Avantia, which mean all the, the media is matched to the media that they were they were produced and frozen in. And so we use the same things and yeah, everybody can see what's uh, what's going on through that, through the window without coming in. Uh, we obviously have got a sink so that we can wash our hands and keep clean on entry and exit. Um, yeah, and so that's the little embryo lab. Uh, very impressive, James. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of people in the UK uh, watching this as well, and I think you've seen Catch, you've seen James, and I know we can see Monica after. We've got world-class facilities here in the UK to be looking after your mare to take these oocytes uh, wherever they're going to be shipped to, you can just see the quality that that, that we've got over here. And I think it's, I think maybe six years ago, we've, we've, it's amazing where we come from in the last few years to where we are. So, uh, but yes, no, it's great, James. Really good Indeed, to show you. And, and, and to be quite frank, you know, this this there's a lot of vets here, I know, but there's a lot of owners as well, owners of mares and people that are interested in this. We we don't we haven't invested our life selling savings and our life's work just to make money out of this. The, the people who are here have got a passion for equine reproduction. And we do this because we're excited by it. We're interested by it. It's not all about making money, but it is, you know, we are passionate about it. And so we, we, we love to work with people like Cesare who are equally as passionate about it as well. That's so brilliant. A, a little yeah. bit, a little bit about some of the, the nuts and bolts of it. Your mare needs to have health tests before we can export the oocytes. OK, if if um, Equus vets get up and running, then we will have to still have some health testing. But it's not as it might be slightly different moving forward in the future. But each collection center might have their own rules and regulations for protecting the horses that are in the facilities. The, the main things that we talk about are EVA, EIA, CEM and strangles. Um, the requirements for European export are mainly CEM by swab and EIA serology, which is a blood test. And depending on which protocol you follow, they're valid for up to 90 days. Now, because there are a lot of vets on here, and I know it's a risky thing to share my screen, but I, I have a, a document here on my des desktop, a file, excuse the desktop, it is uh, forms and information. All of this information goes out to owners and vets um, prior to admission of a mare for Opuixi. We've got a consent form, which has got a little bit of a description about some of the complications, the processes, the costs involved. Monica's going to talk us through a little bit about costs. Declarations for the owner, for the referring vet, a checklist for the owner and the referring vet, and a checklist for us. Um, we've even got a little document, Opu follicle counting letter, you know, we had a situation where um, a, a client sent a mare in to us that the mare had a, a single 25 millimeter follicle and some other small things, but very minimal follicular development. And there was just a little breakdown there that they, they thought a 25 millimeter follicle was OK. And they reported it that the mare had 25 follicles, which is slightly different. So we talk about, you know, vets even video recording the ovaries and sending them to us so that we can have a look and see what's going on there. And the external health letter for the UK is quite a complicated document. We're very specific where we have to send things um, regarding the samples. This is for our facility, but they, the CEM, we do those by PCR. So you only have to do one test. If you do it by another means, you have to do it in multiple um, uh, multiple tests. But, you know, there's lots of things to take into account. The paperwork has to be right. So we go to great extent. We also have a letter that we submit um, with um, the sample to explain to the laboratory what we require them to do. So we go to great lengths to make sure that all of the, the boxes are ticked before we even get started these owners and vet declarations allow us to then certify the health papers which are the documents that we require for export. Now the shipping of oocytes them themselves um, once they're collected we pack them at room temperature uh, and um, Katya and Cesare have already shown some information on these and what they are. They, they are very good things and essentially what they are they're a cardboard box with a polystyrene inner we then have these, um, many of these cool packs you can see there on the top. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's nine of those packs go in, which are all incubated at 25 degrees so that when they go into this shipper, then it can maintain the temperature. And the oocyte should, should then arrive at the laboratory in the 21 to 22 degrees C window. 
Now we do get some extreme weather. Um, and so it is important when we first were doing this, we were putting a temperature logger in the system so that we knew what the temperature was like inside for the oocyte. They must arrive in the lab in 24 hours, i.e. the following day, but we've encountered since we started delays affecting the scheduling and potentially the outcome of the whole process. And no individual courier is to blame, um, but we have had many issues in actually getting oocytes from the UK to, uh, to Italy, um, with some orders delayed, some orders missing and um, added complication and costs. The important thing to mention at this stage is that we have no commercial courier, i.e. DPD, DHL, UPS, will accept any um, shipment for a next day delivery. And this is blamed primarily on Brexit. Um, the problems are that, you know, we can engage with a private courier and drive these oocytes to Italy, but there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of signing off on things, and then for the expensive expenses, associated with it climb dramatically. Just to show that, you know, this is us doing uh, our OPU in hours, and this is the sort of thing that we're getting relatively large numbers of um, oocytes in varying degrees of cumulus around them. They're then packaged up, labeled, processed, and packaged away out for, uh, for Cesare to work his magic on them. One of the questions from the audience was, what about mares that have died? And it is possible to ship ovaries recovered from a mare that has sadly passed away. Um, if you are considering doing this, always liaise with the facility that the, the um, ovaries are going to go to because requirements may vary on how they're able to do it. Theoretically, if we wanted to send the mare's ovaries to Italy, which we have done before, we need to have some samples off the mare for health screening to make sure that they, you know, it's, it's a legal export of, of material. Although there are some times that can be done um, in extreme circumstances for samples, for diagnostic purposes, et cetera, et cetera. So the ovaries are removed, rinsed, processed, and then, and then shipped out to, to Italy or another facility. Another option is that you actually, we, somebody that's experienced can dissect the ovary. They can, just like we uh, do the open opu in the live mare, the oocytes can be recovered from these little follicles um, after the mare has sadly died. And then these can be processed and shipped, shipped in a vial rather than sending the entire tissue. Expectations, uh, Cesare has, has fabulously presented that in, her, in his uh, first presentation. But some of the, the, you know, the outstanding things are 1.63 plus or minus 1.8 embryos per OPU session. And that's from Anthony Clay's data from 2020. Um, the percentages of OPUs yielding greater than one embryo are 67.7%. But of course, there is some degree of case selection that needs to go on. And, and that, in order to get 16, uh, 10 oocytes, you need to have at least 16 follicles. If your mare's only got four follicles to start with, you're obviously not going to be able to get such, such rates, such issues. Internationally record, recorded rates are about a 75% transfer rate and up to 15% pregnancy failure rate. So this is my final run of slides. So thawing of frozen embryos is performed, and it depends on the freezing technique used. There are, there are lots of different things, but in the, in the slow freezing protocol with glycerol, as Cesare described, the embryos are thawed relatively rapidly and then processed in a step right, stepwise manner through a reducing concentrations of glycerol, starting at 8%, 6 4 2 and, and so on. They start off in the straw, obviously, a little bit higher, so we're already stepping that down. And then there's a two-stage washing procedure before we, not supposed to say losing, that's a bit of a Freudian slip, loading into a 0.25 mil embryo straw, and then we do a non-surgical um, transfer. So it just might be quite nice to see what the embryo looks like. This is after it's immediately come out of um, the, the straw, and we can see that it's got there uh, around it. We've got the, the zona and the capsule, and uh, the embryo itself in the middle is shrunken because of the effect of the glycerol. And outside is a little budding, a little bit of a loss of cells through where the, um, the ICSI was performed. Now I'm just going to move through the solution. So as the, the concentrations of glycerol drop, the, the embryo itself within its um, zona and capsule are going to re-expand. And you can see that looks a little bit bigger. 
as the process goes on, it moves around in the in the dish, but it's expanding as we go. Uh, it's getting a little bit bigger uh, before it towards the end stages. It, it's sort of filled that cavity. That potential cavity is gone as the embryo is expanded. And I've just put another little lens on to magnify that a little bit more. But you can see there we have a little bit of outbudding of cells, and it's that's what Cesare was talking about that you can you can potentially sex an embryo using those cells and, and occasionally while you're watching it in the dish those cells can be lost and they can float off within the dish then we we use as a as a standard protocol in our practice we use a, the Wilshire forceps which is where we put a speculum in the recipient there so the recipient there is monitored she's ensured that she's clean physically fit and healthy etc we then use the forceps and do a, a transfer using a sheathed catheter and a transfer gun. And essentially, this is what it looks like looking down the, uh, the speculum. We've grabbed hold of the cervix, so we're not having to touch it. We're using these sterile instruments to, to grab hold of it. And some data from Utrecht published in 2018 did demonstrate that with this process, these, this data isn't for frozen um, ICSI embryos, this is for fresh embryos, but you know, if it's the best technique for fresh embryos, then it's got to, in my opinion, it's got to be the best technique for frozen embryos as well. It was a higher pregnancy rate versus doing it manually. Um, with con the conventional technique where you're doing it blind by hand, there's a significant effect, i.e. experience does make a difference. Whereas there is very little difference or less difference between operators when using this. It does cost a little bit more. It does require more members of team and, and we generally sedate the recipient there. But going through this process, using this technique, we can get very high transfer rates of the frozen embryos in excess of 70%. Okay. That's great. Thank, thank you, James, for that. Just one question, Jake. I mean, those rates are yeah, seventy-five percent. I think you were saying transfer rates. How important is it to pick your mare when you're transferring this? What sort of mare do you sort of look for when you're doing this? Well, the same the same applies to the transfer of normal fresh embryos. You, in an ideal world, you want a young mare between five and nine years of age. We all say that ideally we'd like to, the mare to have had a foal because A, we know she can carry a foal. We know that she lactates well. We know that she's behaviorally a good mother, but that isn't always the case. We are presented commonly with, with maiden mares. There's a full gynecological workup gets performed with a palpation and ultrasound. We monitor the mare through a reproductive cycle. Um, we make sure that she's free of fluid and or infection. We usually take a swab from those mares to make sure that she is clean. And we monitor her right through that cycle, right through to ovulation, so that we, we can then time it very accurately that the embryos are transferred on day four post ovulation. Um, sometimes that does mean we're doing frozen embryos on a weekend, but if we can get as close to the physiological ovulation for those mares, the better. And sometimes we can use ovulation drugs just to move it so that we're not transferring an embryo on a Sunday. Um, but when needs must, we, we do it when it's necessary. And just for people out there, Jay, you know, because you just sort of come into the end of your busy season, obviously, on this, and you'll be picking this up at Zoom fairly soon or September time. You know, I think because obviously there's a lot of people out there in the UK now saying, should I be doing this with my mayor? What sort of, you, when will you be cracking on with this? I suppose you've got to sort the transport out first is one of your biggest hurdles. And, and are you the same as capture? Is that a, a Monday and Tuesday? Is that, is that the same, same when you're doing yours? Well, that's, that's the same protocol because we utilize the services of Avantia as well as, 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 as Monica will do. And, and so the Monday or the Tuesday are the collection days, but you know, they can get built up. And there's a, there's a few other things as well. The stallion that you're choosing and whether or not you've got semen at Avantia and is that semen yours? You know, are you working? What we haven't discussed is that, I don't think we've mentioned it at all, is that very small portions of semen can be thawed for this process, i.e. a single frozen semen straw can be snipped in, into potentially 10 portions, and those 10 portions might do multiple mares. So if you want to access you know, some of these very popular standards, stallions by ICSI, you need to sometimes book in several weeks in advance. And so you may only, so for instance, that there's a straw of for pleasure being cut into um, next week, Therefore, we need to collect the mare on a, on a Monday 
or a Tuesday or, or one of them only to, to access that stallion session. So it does require a degree of planning and a bit of timing. And so the Italian holidays happening and um, Cesare, it'll be very shortly shutting, shutting down for a few weeks if he's not shut down already. And um, so we would hope to take advantage in September once he reopens. But we, the significant challenge is, unless one of my other colleagues here is going to put the hand up and say there's been a breakthrough, um, is getting the US sites to Italy. We have a lot of our clients are all ready and raring to go in their cars to drive these things themselves. But that's not going to be a, uh, an ideal solution. Commercial yeah. careers, and I, I, I hate to say it, it's Brexit. I was just about to come on to, I was going to ask that question. Is, is there any, can you see any light at the end of the tunnel now? Are you making progress forward? And with sort of monarchy yourself and Catcher doing this, I don't know how cost effective it is, but it's only done on a Monday, Tuesday. Maybe you could, there's a, a way, I don't know, get a, a, a flight down there or somebody drive down there, you know, pick up the those sites from the country and actually drive them straight over. Is that a possibility? Well, Katja's Ke smiling lots, so she, she <laughs> may have an update, but Katja, Monica and I, you know, we're all very close. We all share the same passion. So we, we are all very much willing to work together to solve these problems. And, and we have done thus far um, to try and get over the hurdles that have been put in our place through the Brexit issues. Um, but Katya, do you, have you got anything to add tonight? Um, so we're, I'm just um, waiting for some, some um, answer from a client that is actually uh, working in logistics and is, pro is quite uh, sure he will be able to do the transport for us. And um, talking about people with planes, we have, uh, Ed had a client and he had a plane and was more than happy to go and fly them every week for us, but that's uh, probably a bit excessive. But um, no, we're working on it and I'm quite positive that um, I hope to send you all an email next week with um, plans and costs um, involved in that. And then probably we will be able to group um, all, all the, the oversights of the different mares that are done on the same day in, in the UK and uh, share the shipments so, so we can uh, share the cost as well. Brilliant. Well, I've got my private pilot's license. We've got an airfield here. So maybe I can dust it off and, and, and take the exams again and come and... Um, and you use your parachute to, to drop them. Yeah, exactly, and pick it up. Yeah, and, and, not, a, not everybody may know that you have a penchant for jumping out of aeroplanes. We, <laughs> he doesn't have a, a, an X on it. Maybe he's drawing one at his new clinic with an X. Maybe he's can parachute. Land with his parachute. Yeah, I can parachute into Cesare's place, definitely. And Lee, <laughs> you know, you're in Ireland, so in theory, you're, you're in, in Europe. Uh, would, are you going to say have the same problems or can you ship them straight there um no we seem to be okay actually uh not affected by brexit so we can um ups, uh, <laughs> UPS can pretty much guarantee obviously the normal you know they might get lost scenario i think it's about one in 20 within europe seem to go amiss but um yeah we do have ups that right are. well uh, thank you very much uh, uh for that james i really really appreciate your your, your input and it's great to see around your facilities it really is absolutely uh, looks amazing um just uh one next poll question uh, before we come on to our, our final uh person uh is would you consider using ICSI on your uh, you know for your own purposes you know would you would you like to use the ICSI process on your mares uh, it's just a simple yes or no on that one so it'd be interesting how many people are watching this will be interested in that uh, and last and certainly not least, uh, uh, Monica, um, literally, who is about 300 metres away from me, I think, around the corner. Um, and Monica's been, I keep thinking, you've only been there a few years, but it's a long, quite a, quite a few years now you've had to put up with my brother, haven't you? Uh, and uh, it's around the corner. And you've been doing the, the I mean, you, you were there with Neve, um, do, helping with the, the ICSI and when the, when the foal arrived and was part of that. So... Um, it'd be nice to sort of to hear about your experiences where you I see you've got an ICSI rig right behind you, uh, how close you are maybe to starting doing that and your obviously your ICSI experience. And I suppose we all want to know a bit about the costs. I know it's a, a ballpark figure. Uh, it's not just, it's, it's a rough idea. Um, so yes, it'd be great to hear from your experiences on that, Monica. 
Okay. Well, part of um, of what uh, our lab experience was has been described by Neve um, and uh, Steve anyway, but um, I'll try to not to be too repetitive. Um, the, um, oh, hold on. I need to share the screen. We've had some great uh, people coming back to us saying fantastic presentations to, to you. I'm a student at the Royal Veterinary College, absolutely loving this evening and learned so much. So thank you, everybody. Another one from Sean saying absolutely lovely in the webinar. Thank you so much for all involved. Can't wait to see this coming to Northern Spain commercially. So yeah, we've uh, so really appreciate uh, your, your input. Okay, sorry, go ahead, Monica. That's okay. So the lab was um, set up quite a few years ago now, and um, um, it was possible to set up due to this um, um, KTP funding, um, where there were three partners, and uh, it obviously made it slightly more uh, accessible financially. Uh, Twemlos was involved with it uh, as long uh, as, well, as well as uh, the Liverpool University and the Liverpool Women Hospital, where Steve was at the time. Um, and uh, we basically all had access to the knowledge of the other partners, which uh, made it really interesting for us, especially it was um, so an eye opener to work with um, uh, human embryologists, because obviously they had quite high standards compared to ours um, in the um, in the veterinary industry. And I remember uh, uh, Karen, which uh, at the time was working with Steve. Uh, came to see us and um, I don't want to say she was horrified by uh, what she saw when, uh, um, when she came to visit us, but um, she gave some suggestions about um, the level of cleanliness that uh, we could achieve uh, uh, and we should have achieved uh, instead. Um, so the, uh, the lab was initially set up um, at the University of Liverpool, where the Neve was mainly based. Um, and this uh, on the left, you can see, was the room. Uh, not a very big lab, but very functional. Um, uh, certainly a very, very uh, smaller version of uh, Cesare's place, but um, we are not 35 years in the business yet. So hopefully um, in the future, uh, you know, we'll be able to uh, improve it and get bigger uh, like Cesare did. Um, you can see that uh, there is all the equipment necessary, um, and I'll show you is the same equipment that has been moved here. Um, during the years where uh, the lab was uh, working, we were able to um, uh, try um, a lot of procedures. None of none of it was uh, was ever uh, available commercially. We did it only for research and uh, for our own development, hoping to offer it commercially, but. We never, we've never been able to actually make that step. And uh, we're hoping um, to uh, be able to offer it, uh, maybe, you know, probably not this year, but uh, uh, maybe next year, for especially for the UK based mass. And I suppose Brexit is quite an opportunity in this, in this sense. Um, we have been able uh, to do, um, to process hundreds of uh, old sites during the time uh, where the lab was uh, up and running. They were either collected through open pickup, like um, you have seen uh, uh, from uh, uh, Katja's description, uh, so on live mass, but we were also able to collect a lot of uh, eggs uh, from um, um, post-mortem, uh, either from the slaughterhouse or now that died. Uh, and that's a very interesting application, uh, especially for us being based in the, in, in the UK. So it, it means that you don't have to ship the ovaries uh, overseas, so you could actually you know, be able to, uh, you could collect the old sites in the UK and then process them in the UK, because it's, it's quite tricky to ship all sites of a deceased mare um, abroad, especially for the health tests and so on. Uh, we, were, uh, um, we were helped by a human embryologist, which is uh, here pictured uh, uh, at the bottom, uh, Karen, and she was the person effectively doing the ICSI. Um, as Stephen was saying, in, um, in human embryologists, they use mainly conventional, conventional ICSI, and that's what um, uh, we ended up doing. Uh, we started trying to use a laser, but that wasn't really working very well. So we then switched to um, conventional ICSI, and then is when uh, um, we were able to produce the embryos. We were also able to try um, another procedure called all site transfer, 
uh, at, the, at the time, uh, ICSI wasn't as efficient as it is now. And to be honest, uh, now ICSI is so efficient that it's probably, um, it's not, it's, it wouldn't be recommended to use all site transfer anymore. Um, because there is, um, with all site transfer, there is a surgery involved. You can see here at the bottom. And basically, um, instead of producing embryos in the lab, you harvest the um, all sites. They need to be at a certain stage, so in um, mature, and then you transfer them into the oviduct of the mare. But obviously, because it involves a surgery, um, it's not... Uh, um, it's not so animal friendly and also there are other limitations about what type of semen you can use. So it's usable for overcoming infertility problems in the mare, but it's not, uh, it wouldn't be the right procedure, for example, if you want to use a small amount of semen or semen from very expensive stallions. Um, as the result of the uh, work in the lab, um, uh, a few papers have been published with all the details uh, uh, of the lab work. Um, and, uh, you know, they took a lot of um, uh, hard work. Uh, but, you know, if any, since uh, it's 60% vets, if any of you is interested, I just uh, uh, put them up here. Um, these are some pictures of uh, what we managed to um, achieve. Um, and you can see there is, uh, um, uh, at the top, there is a, a nice, uh, a really beautiful embryo. And sometimes they, if you are uh, used to seeing uh, embryos in vivo, they can look uh, very, very different. Um, so initially, because we were not sure if they were embryos or not, we were not uh, able to distinguish them uh, very well. We, uh, we stained them and you can see here on the right, uh, um, an embryo stained and you can see all these little dots are basically cells and um, and that's how we knew uh, it was in fact an embryo. When we were confident we could uh, um, actually say they were embryos, then we started transferring them and we were able to achieve um, uh, several pregnancies. And some of them, uh, you know, this one on the bottom left is Twixy, where as you have already seen pictured. Um, and this is also another product of our um, embryos and uh, it's now competing. And it's interesting that, um, we got calls out of uh, all of the ones uh, we managed to, um, um, to, to produce. And I know there, is, um, there has been some uh, talk about uh, calls being uh, maybe a bit more prevalent on the, in the foals that are being born by ICSI. So it would be nice if we could have maybe a comment from Cesare uh, on this, uh, because I get asked that question quite a few times. And um, this is a picture I'll, I can show you live uh, um, later, but basically this is a picture of uh, uh, the lab uh, that has now moved. Um, it had to move because the project uh, uh, finished and Neve finished her PhD. Um, so the lab um, uh, had to move to Twemlos. Um, so the equipment uh, um, has been reallocated in the new room. Uh, it's a really nice and clean room, uh, as Stephen said. Uh, it's really, really important. Uh, we have uh, a room where we change before, <coughs> before we enter. So anything that is dirt, uh, dirty will stay um, outside. And in the lab, you only enter with like um, scrubs or um, lab coats. And you have to wash your hands, change your shoes. Um, um, I tend to wear a hairnet also if I'm, work uh, if I'm working. Um, and um, uh, in the last uh, few years, we have, we've also built uh, um, a new facility uh, as well as James. Before that, we couldn't ship uh, all sites away because we would not have got approval uh, the way we were before. Um, so since we have moved uh, the lab and we have uh, built a new facility, we can now both uh, process the, uh, you know, both uh, work in house with all sites but also uh, ship them away to Cesare. So we have been doing that for uh, last year, since last year, and it's worked really, really well. Again, we, uh, same as Katja and James, collect on a Monday and Tuesday. Um, and I must say, I'm, 
I'm quite amazed by the level. We have been doing open pickup for quite a long time, but uh, I'm amazed by the result that Cesare gets to you know, give us, basically. We, we send him to all sites. Sometimes it's, it's always very nice to be able to send them a lot of all sites, but sometimes, to be honest, they were not a very big number of all sites. And uh, he, was, he was able to produce an embryo most of the times. So I, uh, I was really, really impressed. And I think our clients were very happy. And so the stocks uh, that we have, um, it's heated. So it's quite nice to work in, uh, in the winter. Uh, everything um, can be kept warm and we can be kept warm. I'm Italian, so I prefer to stay um, warm if I can. Um, and um, the new facility is working really, really well. Um, we have been trying also um, some um, um, collection of all sites from uh, uh, deceased mass. You can see here uh, on the right. We do this in a separate room, not inside uh, the pixie lab because that wouldn't be hygienic. So we collect the all sites and then uh, we can take the all sites into the lab and um, um, process them uh, in the lab. But as I said, it's not, uh, uh, it's not up and running yet. We are hoping to, um, to get there in the near future. So stay tuned uh, and by any means call for information if, um, if you want uh, to know more. Um, obviously for the future, we, um, we're hoping to uh, continue to collaborate with Avantia because their results are um, revolved really. Uh, they're the best place in Europe where um, you, can, uh, you can send uh, your all sites. They're very focused on also providing services for uh, rare breeds and genetic salvage. Um, sometimes it's just too difficult to um, send, it would be too difficult to send the all sites away. Um, and so you know, we, we would be very keen to process them um, in the UK. Um, we've also get asked a lot if we can freeze embryos from uh, in vivo, uh, in vivo pr produced in vivo and uh, we're definitely working on it. And there is a technique that has been described about puncturing um, collect uh, embryos collected in vivo and then freeze them. So we're working on being able to offer that service if um, someone is interested. And obviously because of Brexit and the problems with the shipping, uh, we would be very keen to offer um, ICSI uh, services also in-house. And, um, and continue our research activity as well. Um, I'll just show you um, the lab live quickly, and then I will go on the uh, on structure on the um, costings. So, so the other way around. So you can see basically. Ooh, sorry, I have got the mirror screen. So there are the incubators on this. Uh, so here there are the incubators and then there is the, um, the hood with the microscope, just a smaller version uh, of the ones you have seen before. There is the rig there. Um, and that's basically uh, all you need and all we have used uh, um, so far. If you are... Um, if, I, if you're okay, I'll carry on on the costings because I'm sure everybody is quite interested in that. Um, so, um, so as um, James said, uh, um, we need health tests. Uh, to be able to produce health papers to legally export the all sites. This was obviously easier before Brexit. Um, it's now uh, a bit more complicated. Um, so you're looking at around three, 400 pounds uh, to, to achieve all this. The health tests have to be sent to a specific lab. We cannot choose which lab we send it to. So it's basically a fixed cost. We don't, um, we don't make, uh, um, we don't make uh, you, we can decide. And they are quite expensive tests. Um, and they, if the donor is uh, a donor for, uh, uh, for one procedure, 
you still uh, you, you need the same test uh, uh, if, that you would need if a donor is a, a donor for more than one procedure and you have to repeat them every 90 days. So uh, unfortunately, you'll have to spend more money if your donor will be a donor for quite a long time because you have to repeat uh, some of the tests. Um, certain places will uh, charge um, a fee to scan the donor mass to, ju just, to just uh, uh, find them, uh, to try to uh, collect them in the, um, to do the ovum pickup in the best possible time. Um, so it's not, it's not normally like a big fee, something around two, one to 100, 200 pounds a year. Um, to be honest, uh, we haven't really uh, charged uh, very much so far because most of the masks we only scanned uh, uh, one or two times and they were ready to do. I suppose if you have to scan them a lot of times, uh, you know, we have to um, charge you something. And there is the ovum pickup and the sedation, which is uh, in the UK around a thousand pounds, more or less. Uh, if they need a lot of uh, sedation and drugs, um, then the, it might be slightly more, but it is around about a thousand pounds. And then the shipping to Italy, it was um, relatively cheap until uh, before Brexit. And now we don't know exactly how much it will be. You know, there are options there, but uh, they're probably all gonna be slightly more expensive than they used to be with the courier. Just for reference, it used to be about 200, 250 pounds with the courier in uh, 2020. And so it was, uh, it was not, uh, that is not, not too bad for our next day uh, delivery. It's quite important that they get there the next day, you know, within 48 hours uh, uh, maximum. Unfortunately, the couriers now are not even, off even offering the 48 hours. They just uh, completely refuse because of Brexit to give you um, a timeline. Um, <clears throat> once you have... Um, uh, ooh, oops, sorry. So once you have uh, set your all site to our sites to Avantia, um, and then the lab uh, has got its own charges. Um, and basically there is a charge to put the all sites into maturation in the first, um, before you can perform ICSI. And that's uh, the first incubators that Cesare showed. Uh, so they get put in these incubators for um, up to 30 hours, and then they get, um, uh, um, they, they undergo ICSI and at that point uh, then they get put in the maturation and you will know if uh, sorry in the in the culture and then you will know if they um, if, if you have an embryo after um, up to 10 days so if you don't get an embryo uh, you're probably looking at spending um, two and a half thousand plus baht um, this doesn't include necessarily the, ship, the new shipping costs. So it might be then more expensive and it will be slightly more expensive if you require additional uh, um, services from Avantia. Uh, they offer, as, as Cesare said, the embryo sexing. You can also choose to use multiple stallions for the ICSI. There is generally also a storage charge once the embryos are produced until uh, they can be shipped back to the UK. Um, Often, as Cesare said, they produce multiple embryos per ICSI session. So um, I think every additional embryo is only um, another um, 400, 500 euros more. Um, and so that's basically a bonus because um, you have to spend the, 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 fee, the fees to, um, to do the open pickup and the maturation and ICSI are fixed. But then if you get an additional embryo, that is basically um, uh, cheaper than the first one, if you like. Then there are, uh, once you have got your embryos, you have, um, um, you have to ship it back to the UK. And once they are in the UK, um, as James described, you have to thaw them and transfer them. We use the kits from Avantia as well. And um, uh, so there is a charge uh, for them. And then there is obviously our charges to transfer. Um, some people will have their own uh, recipient mass. Uh, in that case, um, you know, they can, uh, they can use their own recipient mass. As um, um, James said, 
um, and as Cesare said, you, you can just monitor them uh, and choose them in their best in the, when they have a, had a really nice cycle. And if they, if they don't have a nice cycle, you just don't use them. You can use them the following cycle. Um, so it's easier to use, maybe even if you have one recipient mare, it's easier to use uh, the one you have. Um, sometimes when you do normal and conventional embryo transfer, this is not possible because they have to synchronize with the donor mare. Um, so if you're using your own, uh, uh, your own recipient, you're probably looking about three and a half, four thousand pounds. If you're using uh, a recipient mare that you want to hire from a center like us, um, you're probably looking um, at uh, about two thousand pounds on top of that plus fat. So this is just to give um, uh, an idea uh, of how much it would cost. So if you have a genetically valuable mare and uh, especially if you want to use uh, one of those really um, sought after stallions, is it ends up actually being not that much more expensive than a, a normal breeding would be. And I think I am uh, finished. Thank you, Monica, for, for that. Um, just so you know, from the poll question that came in, 84% of people watching tonight are interested in uh, participating or doing, you know, in the ICSI. Just Monica, just on one question. Well, on the age of the mayor, I, uh, I think Ches Cesare may have dropped on this. I mean, is there a sort of a fall off a cliff moment for when you're going to get lower sites or is it very much mayor dependent how long you can carry on taking lower sites from mayors? When mares get older, they get less and less oocytes, um, well, uh, um, follicle, follicular development. So it just becomes a numbers game. But I suppose if there are follicles, you can try uh, anyway. I had heard uh, and read before, um, but Cesare didn't mention that it was about 23 years when they saw that then fertility really dropped, um, even in. Uh, for um, you know, um, ICSI embryos. I, I don't know if that is, uh, is his experience as well. We, we, we said with the group that I showed was uh, over 20, that it, you see a, a decline. Uh, it's, uh, it's mainly numbers, and so you need maybe to do more of you to get uh, an embryo. But um, it's also mare related, you know, some mare, they look uh, younger than what they are and you get maybe 18 or mare, old mares with really crappy ovaries that uh, they will not um, give any good oversight. Can, can it be breed related as well? Is it different breeds will, or, or is it? <clears throat> As far as aging is concerned, uh, I wouldn't say no, not the age, but uh, it's not breed, but uh, I shown you that some breed do, do better do or do worse than others. So. And have you done much? We've had quite a lot of talk in the, uh, in the questions about rare breed horses. Have you done much with the more, I know most of your work's on the warm bloods and the sport horses. Have you done much with rare breeds? Horses uh, with with this work. Yeah, we've done something with a, a Russian horse. Uh, I can't remember the name from the Austro-Hungaric uh, Empire horse. Uh, uh, well, I can't remember the name. It's uh, and there was some really also poor semen frauds in uh, years ago, but we did manage to get. Uh, so they were not uh, any worse than the other. And you do something that's very close to my heart and, uh, and really what you've done is quite amazing. I love the rare breeds and especially species and the work that we're doing with Nature Safe Preserving. But you've actually managed to get embryos from the two last northern white rhinos in the world. That must be what an achievement that is to saving a species from going extinct. I mean, I know the people, uh, Richard, <laughs> Sarah Vine out there and we speak to them uh, every now and again and 
uh, and it, I think one of them's called uh, Fatu, isn't it? The uh, one of the, one of the, one of the females. I can't remember the. But that must be just the most uh, incredible experience to saving a species on the brink of extinction. You've actually managed to get embryos from that. That must be just an amazing thing. Yeah, it's quite a unique experience. Uh, we haven't saved the species yet because having an embryo, as you well know doesn't mean having a, a baby born. So now we are struggling to get pregnancies in some fertile females. But uh, yes, this far to this, uh, this uh, female, which is the youngest, uh, is the daughter of the two. And she produced 12 embryos in uh, the last three. Were produced. We were down in the beginning of July and we had a collection and uh, ended up with three embryos. And we have 12 frozen and out of six uh, collections. So she's averaging as well as the mares that uh, we do. Uh, yeah. Using a really, really poor quality semen that we had you know, to do sort of all uh, sort of uh, uh, artifacts to get it working. The pressure of, <laughs> of doing that one is that, is, did you do that one yourself or, uh, or do you do the other? Uh, because the pressure. When you've got such a valuable animal, as in a you know for what it's worth for the for the biodiversity and everything, you know, yeah, well, I, uh, I supervise uh, the collection is done by the group in Berlin by Thomas yeah. uh, in the Brandon Door. You know, if they're using the technique that I developed for the horse, which uh, has made them some improvements. The vertical probe is done transrectally in the northern white rhino because it's a long. Uh, uh, you know, there's a long distance that you cannot reach the ovary through the vagina, so they go through the rectum. They develop a, a one and a half meter long probe. Uh, but then the, the aspiration collection and searching and shipping, it's uh, all uh, translated from the equine world that we do. And uh, the ex situ, it's, uh, so it goes through, in, in the lab I have, you know, people specializing, the one that handled the semen, the one that handled the ICSI. So I used to do ICSI 20 years ago, 10 years ago, but not, uh, not now anymore. Yeah, I've seen that probe. It puts yours into significance, Catcher, the probe that I've seen that's worked for. Uh, I've seen the video of that where they collect the oversights. James, you've got your hand up for the question. Yeah, I, I, you've passed me by, really, with the achievements with the sort of the rare species but we, we've been working with some rare breeds we've we've done a little bit of a thing where we've given some of our time and our expertise to try and get results with opu ixi and we've tried to help the hackney a little bit as well but you know these are these are big challenges and the thing that prompted my hand was just to acknowledge that you know yes that that large data is fabulous in getting to the nitty-gritty of what what the facts and figures are. Um, however, you, you've always got to remember there can be an individual mare and stallion effect as well. So it's all about how, you know clientele using this service, having appropriate expectations about what they might get. Yes, the averages are 1.6 to two, but you know some people get multiples, six, some people get nothing. And it's, uh, that's been the hardest thing for us since we started this so many years ago in, in people understanding and, and, and really grasping and getting appropriate expectations because it, it can be career changing for a mayor, but it, it might, it's not an option for, for every mayor. Yeah. Um, and I think if you're unsuccessful once, the data would support potentially a change in stallion. Would you agree with that, Cesare? Mm, yes, that might be an option, uh, especially <clears throat> for uh, Arabian horses where there is a lot of inbreeding. We, we learned that from cattle. If uh, you have too much inbreeding, the efficiency drops. With uh, uh, warm blood, uh, I think we see more variation with batches of semen from the same stallion than uh, that can rather than changing stallions, but um, so change batch rather than yeah, yeah that uh, frozen in different time or maybe you know you don't know how many hands uh, it has been through or how it's been handled uh, before you get it. So that uh, could be you know has been an option in some cases. Yes. Yeah, great, and and thank you, Fred Barley's on here. Yeah, he's. Uh, 
he's given us a thank you for all the support for the for the rare breeds and uh, we quite often not say overlook them but a lot of this work is done for for the, the warm bloods and the big but we can see all the positive of ICSI, how it can really help rare breeds uh, in, in many ways um yeah. you know so it's i think furioso, uh, tool is furioso the, the rare breed of the austro-hungarian empire furioso right right yeah so i think and mm -hmm. and we've sort of been going on for a couple of hours now so we've got to draw it to close up i think we could literally i don't know i find it absolutely fascinating and i'm not even in the ICSI, ICSI, ICSI world as much as, as the panelists are i find it absolutely fascinating i really do and there's so many questions but Cesare, before we go, is there anything in the future? Can you see how can you see it ICSI sort of playing out in the future? I presume it's just going to get bigger and bigger and more people. Is there different directions it's going to go in? Uh, maybe we'll be using sex semen. I don't know. How can you see it sort of playing out? Um, <clears throat> well, there are many options. The first problem that we are facing now is that we are filling up tanks of many clinics of embryos and uh, they, they don't have the recipients to transfer them. So I think that uh, marketing of, or selling of these embryos uh, for the States, for instance, there was one question whether we can ship eggs to, to the States, for example, and with the testing that uh, James mentioned, uh, maybe they need to, to be, there is another one that needs to be done, but then they qualify for export to the United States and you know, for one blood, that could be a market to, or I know that uh, people in, in New Zealand, they want to import. So for, for breeders that do, do this, uh, you know, breed horses as a, a business, then ability or possibility to sell the embryo would, uh, you know, create great opportunities for, uh, you know, for uh, business-wise. Technically, you know, sex semen, we did work uh, many years ago with sex semen, and, uh, and, uh, but still the horse is more fragile than the bovine. And uh, I know progress has been made in bovine. The sex semen now is much better than years ago, but with the horse, we're doing some work with, um, uh, with, with you actually, with, uh, but uh, it's sporadic, so we need more, uh, but certainly will not be as, as easy as uh, with the bovine. We, we can use it, but uh, the data we had in the past, it's uh, you get uh, much lower cleavage and uh, the embryo can get embryos, but at much, much lower piece. So I think it pays off to do the sexing by PCR because you get as many more embryos by using conventional semen. Then you go on and sex the embryo theory and you end up with more female embryos than not uh, uh, without. Monica mentioned about uh, uh, sex uh, skewing. I would say that over large numbers, it's true that there are uh, more males, but it's uh, 55, 45. So, I know there's been report of 70% uh, males, but these are, <clears throat> you know, there's been one year and then the other year there were more females. So overall, our experience, it's uh, 55 males, 45 females. So right. if you want to be sure of a female, you can sex the embryo. And that, that would be rather than sex semen, unless they come up with a much better quality uh, equine sex semen. Right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Cesare. Thank you. We've also got Karen uh, uh, on here tonight, who's just said, and she actually very much helped Neve, didn't she, uh, uh, produce the, our first foal. It's, so it's great to see that you've been watching this. Um, I think we better draw it to a close because I think we really could be here all night. Uh, firstly, I've got a big thank you, um, Cesare, really, for allowing us into your world of ICSI, allowing us into your lab and having a look round. Uh, you know, I'm speaking for myself and I speak to everybody out there. We found it quite excellent. There are comments coming in every five minutes. How brilliant it's been with everybody's input tonight. I've had very little. So it's, it's been great for a change for me to, to stand back. Uh, so thank you for, 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 for from us here. Uh, I've got to thank Cooper Surgical uh, really for sponsoring tonight uh, uh, and Stephen for doing the presentation. It's very much um, without them, it'd be hard to put it on. Um, our panelists, wow. I mean, we've seen the comments that are coming on here. What a range of panelists. We could, I mean, to me, you know, we couldn't have picked a finer 
panelists here tonight. So uh, thank you, Catcher from Sussex FY for all your input. Loved your diagrams, brilliant. Your videos and everything, fantastic. Neve, it's great to see you back and hopefully in Ireland soon, you'll be uh, starting to uh, pick this up and run with this now uh, as soon as you can. So really looking forward to how you know, you've done it, you've produced the poll, so you, you, you're, you're just gonna get back up and running again, which is great to see in, in, in Ireland. Um, James, well, what an amazing place you've got there, and it's great to see the work you're doing uh, with the with the rare breeds. Obviously, and I obviously have got a real passion for rare breeds. Any time it mentions that, they get a big tick in my box. So, uh, but what a setup you have there! It really is a, a second to none, and it just shows in the UK what we think of XC and I think how it's going to go forward. People are investing in it, so that must say an awful lot. Monica, I must apologise. I think we move straight on to Cheshire before. Thank you for your lecture. I didn't thank you at the end of it. So thank you so much for putting that together and explaining the costs uh, associated with that. And uh, as I say, yeah, hopefully you, you might be starting to uh, offer, the, offer some, the process as well in the UK and seeing your new facilities. And Equus Vets, you know, very much for sponsoring it. It'd be really interesting to see how they get on with their facilities and seeing what's around the corner as well. So. It takes a team effort. A few other things. We are hopefully one of our next webinars. We, we're going to do the next one in October. And that's we're hopefully going to do that all about sex semen. So that uh, uh, and also we're going to do one all about our tissue banking, biobanking for rare breeds and what we can offer for rare breeds. So we're going to do one purely on rare breeds as well. And all the new technologies that we have down here in our lab for growing cell lines and all that side of work. So um, thank you for everyone listening on uh, on. Uh, on Facebook, we've got quite a quite a following on there, which has been great tonight. There's a lot of questions. I'm going to come back to some of the panelists. So after I might be throwing these over to you, I'm afraid. There's so many questions that have come through. We can't answer them all tonight. Some really interesting ones. So I hope you don't mind uh, from from that side. Uh, we just uh, uh, other announcements. We do offer a frozen semen handling course in September, October, November for people who want to handle frozen semen, handle nitrogen, do nitrogen handling courses as well. I've got to thank Amy downstairs. She put this webinar on. I had very little to do with it. I'm quite lucky I sit in front of the screen. So uh, Amy put them on. She's been lazing with the panelists and doing all the publicizing and putting out there. It's a second one she's done. And it's been, to me, it's been pretty seamless, very seamless. So obviously thank her. I've got Pam sitting to my right that you haven't even seen, see, seen, seen here. Uh, so Pam's been pointing the questions to me uh, and really she's been helping out enormously uh, with, with, with setting this up and very much been communicating with uh, Avante and Cesare. So really appreciate that, Pam. Um, and we've got obviously collection courses coming up and I've been asked to mention about the, uh, the, 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 the conference facilities here. Have I missed anything out, Pam? I'm always bad about not thanking someone. I hope they thanked everybody on the panel. Uh, I think we're good. I think we're good. So um, yeah, we always like to hear from yourselves. If there's a webinar that you would like us to put on, um, let us know, email us, drop us a line, let us know what you think. We've always wanted to try and improve them. We've, some of the ones I know are very practical that we do on semen assessment, we'll come back to them. Uh, and if you want to sponsor one of these, we're always looking for sponsors. Um, uh, hopefully we give you value for money. Uh, we try and uh, make sure you, you get a good plug. Uh, and lastly, you'll be getting an email the next few days um, and on there, if you can, and if you enjoyed it, if you can donate a little bit to Nature Safe, and this will stop, 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 stop some of these species. Uh, oh, there we go. Thank you. This will help uh, stop species from going extinct. So, yes, it's a big thank you. There's all the all the logos from everybody there. So, um, that's all that I have to say tonight. Um, what's oh, thank you everybody. For, cheers from Australia. So we've even got somebody from Australia. I think it must be in the middle of the night for you. Thank you, Tullis and Pam. Uh, yeah, uh, so and, and uh, yeah, from all people. So, um, yes, yeah, so I've loved it tonight. It's a different way of doing it. And again, thank you for everybody for coming. A good night, and I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And this is all, we can always watch this again, by the way. It's on repeat as well. So, it'll be put out there. So, thank you again. Cheers. <laughs>